You know, for the last couple years, I've been more and more convinced that aliens or lizard people run the world. That's why I'm wearing the shirt. Anyway, here's the giveaway for today. Just want to throw that out there so that it's on air when we actually find out that it's true. Here's the giveaway. Today's giveaway is the Prime Bundle. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, for free for one of you lucky viewers. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Got to do all those things. If we like your comment and we pick your comment, we'll notify you and get free access to that bundle, which is very valuable, very cool. And as Adam says in the episode, if you're a trainer, you don't own those programs. You're an idiot. Um, so check those out. Also, huge sale going on right now. Two of by far the most popular workout programs that we have. MAPS HIT, that's high intensity interval training. So it's designed for rapid fat loss in a short period of time with short workouts that are hard. And MAPS SPLIT, this is a hardcore bodybuilding style split routine program. Both of those programs are 50% off right now just for the month of December. So if you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code DEC50. So that's DEC, the letter D, the letter E, the letter C, and then the number 50, no space with all of those for that discount. All right, here comes the show. All right, today's fit tip, fasted cardio. One of the best ways to burn lots of body fat, but not for the reasons you think. <laughs> All right, guys, let's talk about- I like this advice. Fasted cardio. I like this advice. This was a bro science advice. I've only heard this from bodybuilders for the most part. Yeah. The, the, okay, so the way that bodybuilders explain it's wrong, but the way that they would explain it is they would say, fasted cardio, because you're fasted, you're going to tap into fat stores better and burn more body fat because you don't have carbohydrates to utilize, and so it's a better way to burn body fat. That explanation is actually wrong. However- they did notice that they would be they would burn more body fat doing fasted cardio. There's another reason why they just didn't figure out what that reason was. And it has more to do with behavior than it does physiology. More or everything. It's everything. It's everything. It, it has everything to do with behavior. And the, I did fasted cardio the entire time that I was, uh, not the entire time, but like I consistently did it uh, for every show. So every show I'd get ready for um, fasted cardio um, heading into the final weeks was always part of my routine. And what I, what I saw was that if I got up and did fasted cardio, I was up an hour earlier moving uh, consistently more than I would if I didn't. Mm -hmm. And even if I didn't get up early, let's say, because maybe I didn't have to be somewhere that day and I slept in a little bit and I got up and I still did fasted cardio, I still would go do movement before I decided to eat food, which the reverse would have happened had I not done that. I would get up and then I would eat first and then I would go yeah. start my day. So that would also push meals out even further, which it would end up resulting in potentially lower calories a day. So the behaviors around it, I found extremely beneficial. And because there is, there's two camps on this, you have the bro science camp that tries to explain it with glycogen stores and then tapping into then right. fat as your main source of fuel and, explaining it that way uh you have the the bros and then where you're, you're to your point uh that's been debunked but then you have the other side the the science nerds that want to shit all over it and say that's not true and then now you have a bunch of people that stop doing it because they don't see there's any value in it or never pursued try, trying it because their favorite science nerd on instagram has told them that fasted cardio is a myth and it doesn't work 100 percent. and i would love to challenge that and say Absolutely, it does. Just not for the reasons that they promote and they say. And I think there's tremendous value in doing this. And if you've never tried this, uh, I urge you to try it. Try it just for a month or two of <laughs> making a habit before you eat, before you do anything. And you and the beauty of it is you don't need to push really hard. Just get on yeah, a treadmill. And now, and now, to be to be clear, right? Uh, apples to apples, everything's controlled. Right? It's about calorie deficit. That's mm -hmm. that's what determines how much fat uh, you lose. And this is why the science people are like, look. Doesn't matter if you burn glycogen because you're fasted; it all evens out. It's all about the calorie deficit. But it's it, we if we cannot discredit human behavior. That's actually the most important thing. Look, when I train clients, when I figured out the behavior part, that's what I trained. Yeah. I stopped training the physiological aspects nearly as much because it was all about uh, the behavior. There's one more thing too we're missing here, and studies will show this. Studies will show that when people start exercising, even if they have no intention to change their diet and their nutrition they start to do it a little bit naturally. They start to change some of the other behaviors because the exercise component has happened. So well, what I say is start your day off with a workout. Yeah. And what tends to happen is because the day started out that way, 
you're more likely to be more fitness and health minded the rest of the day. And that I firmly believe in. It's one of the reasons that's why I work that's out. That's where I see the most value. Yeah. I mean, it's really just setting yourself up for the entire rest of the day with a good uh, practice, good behavior, good right. discipline. And, you know, that could that could be all kinds of different versions of that, that, um, you know, is a healthy practice that you're trying to establish. Because if you can establish that first thing in the morning, I've, I've noticed too, like, if, have you noticed like your best clients that have had the longest success are the ones that come in first thing in the yes. morning. And it's like a ritual and it's like something that, because nothing interrupts that. If it's the first thing in the day, the rest of your day could go left, side, up, down, yeah. wherever. But if you can, if you can nail that down, whatever that healthy practice is for you, it's going to, you know, uh, lead you in a, in a good direction. Such a good point. If I'm in the habit of not training first thing in the morning or doing fasted cardio, it's very easy for me to swing into Chick-fil-A right before I get to the studio and go, mm, I'm going to have a you know, chicken, egg, biscuit and cheese sandwich today. Mm. And then to get into the habit and the routine doing that. It's a really good sandwich. It is almost impossible <laughs> For me to make that decision when I've been walking on a treadmill half awake for You're an hour, minded. I'm thinking about my day. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about the first meal I'm going to eat and what the rest of the day is going to look like. Yep. It is so much easier to stay on that track when I started the day. So, and and we can't exactly measure how valuable that is, but I know from experience, it's incredibly valuable. So the commu the science community that has shit all over the fasted cardio group of people that have been touting it for years. I can't stand because there's there's tons of value in getting up and doing it it's just because they, they communicate it They wrong. focus on the explanation, but not the fact that it actually works and then trying to figure out, okay, well, why does it work? And maybe it's not this physiological phenomena that bodybuilders you know created, but it still works. Why is it working? And you know, to the morning workout uh, conversation, look, I'll tell you, I managed big box gyms for a long time. These are, these are big box gyms. They're not fitness fanatic gyms. They're kind of the mainstream type health clubs. And I noticed a trend very early on in my career, which was that six. So there's two prime times in big box gyms, two times when the gym is busiest, early morning. And then, of course, after work, after work being the busiest. Right. That's when the most people come in. But the after work crowd was far more transient. It was far more, you know, where I, I would see people come in and then I, did, I wouldn't see them come in anymore. And there's new people coming in. Then the morning when I would go in early in the morning, it was the same people. All that it was the most consistent members by far. Yeah. Now, of course, on an individual basis, if working out first thing in the morning sucks so bad that it makes you not work out, then forget what we're talking about right now. But I, I will stress this for most people, waking up and starting your day with your workout, if you are fitness minded, you're probably more likely to stay consistent and it will likely positively influence the rest of your day more. And I'll, look, straight up, this is for me now. My performance in comparison to afternoons sucks in the morning. I don't get as great of pumps. I'm not as strong. I'm not as driven. I can't work out as hard because it's, it's you know, 7 a.m. You know, in the morning. But I'm way more consistent. I'm better at work. I have better habits throughout the day. I feel good throughout the day. So those first thing in the morning workouts, that, that's, that's all the value right there. It's not the glycogen and the fat and all that kind of stuff. That is all negated once the calories are all counted for the whole day. Well, if you, if you have the luxury, you can do both. Because I, I hate morning workouts. I cannot stand morning workouts. Uh, You're always in a good mood early in the morning. <laughs> so <it's, laughs> I don't. I don't like morning workouts. I just, I, I'm, a, I'm a slow person to waking up, and I need to have at least a cup of coffee or two before I'm feeling it. I like to have at least a meal or two before I love to get a hard workout in. It's hard for me to, to, to get the oomph in my workout, but... It is very easy for me to half asleep, get on a treadmill or get outside in my hoodie. Right. So you're doing go, at least something, right? Right. Yeah. And, and just go walk. And I actually really like that. It's very meditative for me. Mm -hmm. It's quiet early in the morning when mm -hmm. nobody else is really out. You're by yourself. I can kind of organize my thoughts. I organize my day. I think about all the things that uh, this is kind of my way of doing like your, uh, you know, your gratitude journal or whatever like that. Yeah. I'm doing it in my head while I'm kind of walking and thinking about that and your positive affirmations, like such a great, and it doesn't take a lot of energy. If you ask me to go do dumbbell bench presses with hundred pound dumbbells at 6am, really, really hard for me to have done it, mm -hmm. but it, it's hard for me to be consistent with doing that being completely honest. No, that's but a good point. Mm -hmm. I can do both. If I have the ability to get up earlier. So if I'm getting up an hour earlier than what I normally do to go for this walk, and then I can still do my afternoon lift later on. And I, then you're getting the best of both worlds yeah, if you're that, that person. That's a really yeah. good point. All right, I got some uh, some cool, interesting, fun news. Ooh. Did you guys know that the FAA accidentally released 
Jeffrey Epstein's flight logs. Okay, so I heard about this, but what do you mean by accidentally? Like, how does that happen? I don't know about the accidental part. Sometimes I think they're like, it's accidental. And you're like, really? Isn't it? <laughs> I feel like nothing's but accidental. But the flight logs apparently have been released, and people are going to be going through them, and they're seeing all the people that flew on Epstein's plane to his island. Okay, because I, I read that they released that in terms of all of the records between, I think it was like 2013 to 16 or something, but they didn't release names of the people that are on the flights. Well, somebody, I, I, there's also more to this. Somebody was, uh, I guess this is going to be part of the trial, uh-huh. and said things like, oh yeah, Bill Clinton, Prince Andrew, like all these like big players and celebrities and whatever yeah like a lot of people were on his plane to his island well it's always interesting when either epstein is you know in trial or you know locked up or Ghislaine maxwell is like seeing another hearing of what's happening in the news surrounding that there's yeah. usually at least two or three major things that we're kind <laughs> yeah. of looking at elsewhere yeah. meanwhile this is getting zero yeah. coverage yeah the day just lane's uh, thing starts are gonna be like an asteroid it might hit the earth <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow, I swear to God, it probably will. everybody you know, pay attention. Omicron to is out here, oh, dude. Yeah. <laughs> dude, this is but the, hey, yeah, Voltron's coming out. Hey, yeah, and, and last and, pe- and people because this is kind of making the social media news. People are showing these pictures. There's a picture of Bill Clinton walking his daughter Chelsea down the aisle, getting married, and then <laughs> like her head, just like yeah, that. Jill St. Maxwell <laughs> is, is one of the attendees at the at the, at the wedding, like front row, right oh, there. Wow. Well, I saw some absurd uh, already. Like their her defense was was trying to argue that like she's a victim of uh, of Epstein. Like, of course, was, yeah, which makes sense that they would try. To well, argue that's your that. angle, right? Like, he can't he can't rebuttal, dude. Right? They said this is no joke. They said that they that they some they tried to say that some of the details of this case are so disturbing that they told the court we can't release this to the public. What? That's yeah. not true. No, no. That's what they that's, said. That's it's not true. Shit. It's because of who's get, who is going to get connected to it. Of that's course. Why. Of that's course. There's going to be judges of and course. lawyers and politicians. But that's how they spin it in the news. It's gonna, there's going to be, there, I think there's so many people that are attached to this. And even if you're not like fully guilty, like you bring up the flight logs, like imagine if you're just somebody who happened to go there, like you checked it, you didn't do anything wrong, but you're just now associated with that guy. Oh yeah. It's like how it's, bad that looks. And you're probably freaking out. So imagine even if you're, like I said, a person who. You don't, you don't want to be seen you don't want to know anybody to know you even knew this guy right yeah you know you're, it's like oh bill cosby whatever and oh yeah you know oh you know justin used to hang out at his house for sleepovers what hey, <laughs> you know, hey even hey, if hey, nothing hey, happened hey, <laughs> don't tie me into right this. Oh, that so never i, I yeah. mean 100 percent. i think that's the, that's the only reason <laughs> you're why. neverland okay yeah. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, that's, terrible. <laughs> that's terrible i gotta double down dude i don't know about you guys but this trial is i'm like I, i'm like i can't wait to hear what the hell's going on. Oh, man. see, I don't let it, I don't even Dude, think about it because I already know I'm going to be disappointed. I'm going to be disappointed. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you are they are you're, they're going to come out right with over. some bullshit thing at the end of it and you're going to be like it's going to be you know it's like it's like Dude, one I've of those so let down. those movies that have this massive build up and then it just leaves you hanging at the yeah. end of it. That's exactly what's going to happen with this trial. Well, Meanwhile, I think I don't know if you guys remember but when the the whole documentary came out, like I'm like, "Oh my god, I know like I went to high school with one of these girls I that know. was you know, his massage therapist and she brought her sister and like, and I cannot connect with, I have no idea what she's up to. This is true. Everybody, everybody watching this right now, Justin personally knew one of the massage therapists that would be on this plane massaging (laughs) Bill Clinton. Yeah. There's pictures of her with Bill Clinton and and Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. And then, but and you can't get a hold of her. Nobody can. No, I mean, I honestly, I, I, I wasn't that good a friend with her or anything. I, you know, was a loose affiliation, but uh, I had no idea. Like that was even her line of work. And then to see her on that documentary just blew my mind. I'm like, oh my god, you know, like I totally know that girl, oh, dude. This is gonna yeah, be, it just made it more real for me. This is gonna be wild, dude. I mean, what if it comes out that there's like this crazy international ring of disgusting whatever's running this thing? I, would they even let that out? I mean, yeah, like, is any truth going to escape this thing? Or are they just going to spin it like they spin everything else because it's involving so many powerful Bro, people around the world? Well, the thing that, to me, that makes this all, like, I think I'm with you guys. I'm going to be let down is because we can't forget this. Like, nobody can forget this. Jeffrey Epstein was in a cell, watched 24-7, cameras on him, guards dedicated to him. Mm-hmm. On suicide watch or whatever, because they're like, no. But, but they can't. lost the footage, right? And all, yeah, oh, weird. They fell asleep and the cameras turned off and the dude killed himself. Okay. 
Like, for, like really? <laughs> what the fuck is going it's on? It's like, sad that we live in a time a that shitty uh, Hollywood movie. It's I feel like as like, citizens we have we have no power or say in that. Like that's crazy to me that we don't have the ability. It, it feels to, that way. Yeah, it's like what I mean. This is obviously made mainstream news and everybody knows about it because we're aware of it. But what this just highlights to me is like, how much shit are you unaware of that's backdoored and not happening and people that are getting knocked off or go missing or just, right. I mean, it's like, this is right. It, it, to me, it's like, it's so blatant. It's right in our faces. And then in, in addition to that, they're going to, it's ended up going to be a nothing trial. You're going to be completely disappointed afterwards. And there's so many like, blatant evil things going on in this you ever this you ever seen crazy. I, don't, I don't know how yeah. true this is but this so this is just you know reading these conspiracy theory things but you ever yes. seen these lists of the people that had like suspicious suicides that were connected to hillary oh, clinton you ever seen that no, I bro seen. it's a crazy list of like reporters and like car whistleblowers and, and random like really yeah, accidents. That, yeah, like car exploded yeah. or like weird shit. Now, I mean, is it too that like when you are that like coincidental? Well, yeah. when you're that big and famous, it's not. It's like the Kevin Bacon thing, right? Because he's been in so many movies. Yeah. Like you can connect every actor to Kevin Bacon That's within less than six people or whatever. Maybe Doug can pull us up. Like so, if, who, I mean, you're you're the the president's wife and you ran for president, right? I I would think that you're so connected to so yeah. many people that it's not weird that. So was she a lawyer? I know Bill Clinton was a lawyer, but she was a lawyer as well, yeah. like in Arkansas, and then. You you know, kind of worked their way. It, it was almost like they both simultaneously just had this agreement. Like Bro, that's they, almost every trying to get the power. That is almost every yeah. president and right. wife. They, they, almost every every president and their wife got together decades before with the intention of They're trying like a to power couple. Yeah, political power yeah, couple. The, I, I can't remember what's what, that show. Where I was reading this. I oh, House of Cards. House of Cards yeah. kind of shows. Yeah, that. They yes, it, right? they highlighted it's, and, that. and I, I know people that have been associated with with like the the president and then the family that's related, and they say like m many of them have separate, and that's like it's an unsaid agreement that they all make. Like when we go and we're running against each other, it's like you know, I know, we both know that I got my family over in Cuba, you got yours over here, <laughs> yeah. your second family, where your like your real quote unquote wife and Bill's kids like, are. I got my, I got my intern. No, seriously, <laughs> no, yeah. and it's like this unsaid agreement, that, and everybody has that same dirt on each other that you just they they leave that out because that's it, you're now you're messing business with with real personal family life. Like, I, I mean. I can't prove any of this myself, but I've heard that and it makes total sense to me. And when you hear these stories of what they were doing politically before they got married and what who yeah. they're tied to and family, it's like, no, it's just a power couple, dude. Well, power to me is just always interesting. And um, going back to the whole Epstein thing, like it just screams to me this massive like uh, blackmail operation, right? So the whole yes. thing is just like... I mean, I, I even heard, I don't know if it's true, obviously, but there was like another building that had huge, like big screens where they just would yes. watch rooms. The best conspiracy theory what? that I heard was that it was a, a an intelligence agency. And I think they said it was the Mossad, which is, worked for Israel. Yeah. So this was the theory. I thought it was fascinating. I heard that one. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's just, you know, I don't know if someone invented it or whatever, maybe it's true, who knows, but I think it's really cool to hear that it was an intelligence agency and they worked with Epstein and their goal was to get as many powerful people from around the world, from all these major countries, to go there, have sex with underage girls or boys or whatever, film it, and now they have power behind the scenes over all of these countries. Because now they have film of, oh, well, you sure you don't want to pass that bill? Mm -hmm. Because we got this video right here, and or what about this? And So that was like the big... I mean, logically, like it makes sense that somebody out there would... Dude, you know, try to construct. What, what position do you think you have to have in the country to to have the most inside information? I don't think it's the president. No, I think, I, they, I I think, think he's in the, the dark half the stuff too. Oh no! I, who do you who do you think who CIA. do you think you think CIA, CIA head, like head of CIA? The CIA was created specifically to protect uh, the country uh, from the Soviet Union, Cold War. That's when they got all the power. Right. They had a lot of, they get a lot of money that, that people aren't, that is not on the books because they have to operate. Do you guys remember, oh, this was during, during the Reagan yeah, administration. They get their own budget. They don't have to report. Correct. Right? Okay. In the, during the Reagan administration, there was that whole uh, Contra scandal or whatever, where they were literally paying people to, or they were getting paid to smuggle drugs because they had to get money somehow yeah. to support these rebels. 
the taxpayers didn't want to support it, so they found another way to do it, and it's one of the reasons why we got all this drugs smuggled into the country mm -hmm. uh, in the 80s. They're, and they sold, they will sell arms to other countries, or I've heard they'll say things like, okay, we can't sell all these weapons to, I don't know, Pakistan, for example, but we can give you, we can do this bill to give you, you know, a billion dollars for women's studies or whatever, or, you know, you and, and they'll find a way to create this kind of like behind the Which we scenes. we kind of saw a little bit of that in the whole COVID package. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting to uh, see all the money that went uh, overseas. Did we just pass another one? Weren't we doing another trillion something? Uh, yeah, what's, the latest, what's the latest What's the latest infusion just of money? Just print the go? money. <laughs> the last I heard was a trillion dollars. But is that what it is? Yeah. Just, I, I, I can't just, keep track of it, it anymore. Just recently, like a trillion it just got just recently passed. Right? Dude, I, what, Doug, can you do, do me a favor? Because people don't realize how much a trillion is. Let's look at a million and a billion. Look up how long it takes for a million seconds and how long it takes for a billion seconds. Just just to look at the discrepancy there. And then remember, a trillion is exponentially larger than that. So yeah. this this right here will will, will tell you when we yeah, see it. Yeah, because it just sounds like you know numbers when you say it out loud. Yes, like it's not totally. it's not that grandiose. <clears throat> Doug, did you find it? So one million seconds is eleven days, thirteen hours, forty six minutes. So eleven days is a million okay. seconds. How many? How long our, is a billion seconds? Yeah, 31 and a half years. Whoa. So that's, that's quite that's, a leap. 11 days at 31 years. That's the difference between a million and a billion. I've never had someone do this before. A that's trillion? An way, that's an who, interesting way to look at a it. A trillion hey. has got to be, what is a trillion? 31,688 years. Okay. So when we print a trillion dollars, people <laughs> wow. are like, oh, it's a trillion dollars. What a dollars. fascinating way to look at that. Who ever told you to do that? Okay. I, I read that a long time ago, and it just kind of highlighted. No, it is. Well, what, what, see, a, what a great, yeah. what a great uh, metaphor for getting uh, the – because a lot of people can't wrap your brain – a lot of people can't wrap their brain around a million dollars. If you've never, yeah. seen, if you've never seen more than $100,000, even wrapping your brain around a million is a big but deal. That's why it was so crazy to see companies like Apple and Amazon get to that like trillion dollar uh, cash amount. that they Didn't they finally achieve I don't know if they got a trillion or I a trillion that, valuation. I thought that they finally got you know, it. There are some that are You know what now. always cracks me up is when we'll, we'll watch a movie. I hope you don't mind me saying this, Adam. But uh, oh, great. You're, of, of all of us, <laughs> you've seen the most <laughs> cash in front of you. Uh -huh. And <laughs> what, hey, you're the most gangster. <laughs> well, uh, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I'm just saying, right, let's <laughs> leave it at that right there. Okay, true story. Yeah. Keep going. Tony no, Montagna over here. But my favorite yeah. is when people will, will in a we'll be watching a movie and then someone will bring out a briefcase. I got your, you know, $5 million. And Adam will be like, that's not $5 million. It's like ten grand or whatever. Yeah, he just picks it up. He's like, nah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, it, you're they, missing at like, least fifty thousand. Like a hundred thousand yeah. dollars, it, it looks a lot different than you think, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's why I think this uh, this analogy or metaphor you just gave is, I think, phenomenal. I've actually never had somebody try and break it down. Dude, that Eleven way. days, thirty-one yeah. years, thir three thousand. No, thirty-six thousand. I think he said. What thirty-one thousand or three thousand one hundred. Something ridiculous. It was three thousand one hundred. That's crazy. It's dude. insane. Oh. It's insane. Yeah, to go from 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 like hours, lead. days dude, to years, like dude, that's crazy. Dude, I got the list of the of the suicides connected to. Oh, okay, let me dude, hear. check this out. Even though I'm gonna stick with what I think. Right? Yeah, I know, but this, hey, this this is it's still fun. Still, still fun. It's still fun to play the Kevin this. Bacon game. 1977, yeah. Suzanne Coleman commits suicide. She was alleged to have a sexual affair with Bill Clinton during the time he was the Arkansas State Attorney General. Okay, so that happened. No autopsy was performed. Suicided. Uh, 1991, Danny Casolaro committed suicide. He was an investigative journalist who had been working to undercover the leads of several then-rumored Clinton scandals, including activities at the Men, uh, Mena Airport in Arkansas. He was found dead in his hotel bathroom with both wrists open, though he had repeatedly informed his family and friends if he had met such a fate, it would not be suicide. 1992, mm. Eon Spiro committed suicide. Is there a toxology report on <laughs> An international businessman and co commodities broker, as well as government associative operative he was involved in collecting evidence in the inslaw affair which connected with bill clinton and wife hillary he told friends he had been receiving numerous death threats although when the bodies of his wife and five children were discovered by authorities in their home and spiro's body dead of cyanide in his car it was ruled a murder suicide 1993 john wilson committed suicide this was a chairman and civil rights activist. He claimed to be involved in the Whitewater scandal, which focused on questionable land deals and money laundered tied to the Clintons. I mean, I, I'm not going to go through this because I Bro, swear how to God, many are, like, are you kidding me, dude? I, I would. We're going to be here for a long time. That many? There's way. There's 2000. There's a bunch in 2016. There's 1996. Bro, how These many? All, Give me how many? How many? Oh, let me see all the ones that we just. Okay, so I did. There was the 1990, uh, uh, 1977. So one. Then there's two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, yeah. fifteen. There's fifteen there, and this says it's a partial list. 
But these are all people who were closely connected. Many of them were investigating the Clintons or were, you know, had some dude, information like on them. Dude, they're like the ultimate mafia dons. Yeah, dude. Yeah. It's <laughs> just crazy. Stuff. Bro, I'm almost that, afraid for you for bringing that up. No, I, let me tell uh, you, dude. I'm almost, <laughs> I'm almost afraid for you bringing it up. Uh, Bill Clinton, one of the best presidents. Of all time. <laughs> I mean, he can really play a saxophone. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. he gets down. Could you imagine that? That's crazy. I know. And that's, I mean, have you che- like fact checked that or is that just like, because you got to be careful today, man. Someone just draw a bunch of random. Nah, how do you fact check, check that? Uh, yeah. I just pulled like that up right now. Yeah, yeah, that was, <laughs> yeah. There's no fact checking going on. No, yeah. it's just like, <laughs> choose your own adventure. That dude, the meme you posted today was so funny with the, uh, it was a, it's a meme of a guy robbing a grocery store and he's got a ski mask on. You can't see he's his eyes. Or he's got a gun and gloves on and he's, and he's holding up and right behind him is, you know, somebody obviously like scared standing there and they don't have a mask on and it's in San Francisco looking for, you know, an uh, unmasked man in, in yeah, groceries. Please identify the unmasked man <laughs> but the police is That's looking the world for we live in now. That's, that, that's summed it up for me. Uh, uh, that, that was pretty that's funny. That's so funny. Hey, so um, kind of along these lines, uh, news just came out. LeBron, he's got COVID. Oh, yeah, COVID. LeBron, huh? Oh, wow. Yeah, we'll see. Weird though. He's, he's all Mr. Uh, super vaccinated and following the rules with his mask on. Well, I wonder I mean, how that happened. Yeah. I hope he's, I mean, I, I mean, no, I, yeah, want, I wish no, Ill. they're okay. Have we had any, okay. So I've seen, obviously, uh, you know, one side loves to highlight anybody that was ever in sports, health or fitness and they're how difficult they're dealing with. Right. Like every time, like somebody who is at all remotely considered healthy, uh, even though there's much more to yeah. health than just your physical appearance, uh, we love to highlight them and point out, oh my God, they're on their deathbed or whatever like yeah. that. I don't know anybody who is a current athlete who's in great shape, physical condition that has gone through COVID and like either died. Have you heard anybody who's died uh, from that? Well, oh, Diego Sanchez. I, not dead. Sorry. As of the recording of the podcast, he's in the hospital. Remember the MMA? Yeah. Fighter. Yeah, he's in the hospital Diego right Sanchez? now. Diego Sanchez? Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. He's, 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 now, is he still? Is he still? Or yeah. would, and it, as of the recording, was right he now. still fighting? Do you know? Like, I don't know much about. I mean, Diego yeah, Sanchez. he's fighting for his life. Because yeah. I, so I have known some people that were either that got really, really sick, um, that were younger, that were like health and and some um, either either passed away or were just like in the hospitalized. That the average person would go, oh my god, they're relatively healthy yeah. you know they're not obese or really overweight they're fairly young but when i found out more about their lifestyle and what was going on in their lives currently at the time uh, i've yet to meet someone who wasn't under a tremendous amount of stress that they were going through or, some drugs or doing cocaine mm-hmm. yeah. or doing stuff the outside yeah. of like so even though their body fat percentage wasn't through the roof and they weren't 75 years yeah. old uh, and so the outside goes, oh, that's person ex- exposed something. Yeah, there's yeah. other other parts that were really hot, or smoking cigars all mm-hmm. the time, you know, doing things like that. So yeah. I, I've yet to meet somebody who I know has been really, really healthy. I, you know, and I, that you can prove that. I wonder. I I had this conversation the other night with a friend of mine. Like, I wonder what this would be like if it were 50 years ago, without media being so easily accessible. You know. Like if this pandemic existed fifty years ago, would the fear be the same? Of course, no, no, no way. Course I don't not. think so either, right? It, it would be more proximity, right? If you knew, like who you know, yeah, who you know, and if if they're struggling with it, it'd be like, oh wow, we need to. I think it'd be more isolated incidences instead of taking on this everybody in the world numbers. You know, yeah. I also think that you we would naturally self regulate to your point. That you made the other day. It's all it's been I, proven. I really think that if if you found somebody who was in your family or connected to you that was really sick or that you saw pass, it would scare you enough that you would you it would change your behaviors without being told what you need to do whatsoever. I think you would self regulate, and I, I I think a lot of people would do that. They actually did that. Yeah. They followed uh, I think it was cell phone tracking data. And they found that in areas where the cases went up, and these are areas without strict lockdown laws, right? That people naturally stopped going to more crowded areas and started kind of self-isolating. And it was similar behaviors to places that had extreme you know, lockdown measures or whatever. So, and again, we ignore human behavior whenever we pass any law. We think, oh, this is going to work, but we got to look at you know human behavior. But yeah, I wonder if the if the fear would be anywhere the same, like this new, uh, this new strain, right. That's coming out that is 
not very many people have it. I think it's it, it's not widespread, not causing a lot of stuff. So far, the data is showing that it's mild. That's so far, but it could change. But boy, is the media going crazy over this and making it feel like we need to be scared like crazy. We just constantly need a boogeyman. That's what just upsets me about the news. Yeah. Like, like, how much of that can you take in all the time with uh, with staying sane? You know what I told my um, – because I have a family thread, uh, excuse me, um, thread with a lot of family members, aunts and uncles and cousins. And it's, it's usually – it's a wonderful thread. We share pictures of babies and talk about holidays and all that stuff. And um, I have some family members, and, and I can fall into this, by the way, that, boy, do they spin constantly in this, right? And they're constantly sharing mm -hmm. news articles. And, oh, my God, this is what, I can't believe that they're going to do this, and I can't believe they're going to do that. And I had some conversations with them, and I said, you know, I, I, I can get caught up in that myself, especially because I have a tendency towards hypo, being a hypochondriac. So this is like my worst case scenario. Like the worst thing ever for me is an illness that's spreading. Like that for me fucks with my head more than almost anything. You guys know that yes. about me. Mm -hmm. And I told them, you I said- better with a meteor coming down. Yeah, through. like it just, it just it messes with me anyway. And I told them, I said, what I had to do is I had to consciously turn shit off. So I literally would tell myself for four days, I'm not going to read anything about any of this stuff. And the improvement in my mental health was incredible. Ignorance yeah. is bliss. Yeah, and it's not even that. It's not, I'm, I'm trying to stay, because then they would argue me, don't you want to stay informed? I'm like, listen, if you do it for four days and some crazy emergency happens, pretty sure someone's going to come tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's not about staying informed. It's about feeding that fear monster that lives inside of you constantly. Uh, Eckhart Tolle would, would call it the ego, right? The, the, the pain body. Constantly needs to feed itself with negativity, and we yeah. think we don't like negativity, yet we seek it we out. We seek it out all we the constantly, time. Constantly, yeah, constantly seek it out. Well, so. on a positive note, I Thanks, promised Adam. the audience. Yeah, I, I pro promised the audience that I would share more, both on the real estate side of things, and then also uh, our angel investing. So uh, recently, uh, we have invested in Zbiotics. I think we mentioned that's it. how much we that's how much we we believe in the company is yeah we put our so, money where our mouth is uh very exciting i mean we're we're excited about it uh we were already considering doing it before we had zach come to uh the, the studio just a couple weeks ago um and just blown away and impressed by uh the direction that the company is going in what they were already doing they've had incredible traction and growth and they're doing well um, and then to see what their plans were. And I didn't know that. So up into this, I looked at them as just this cool drink that you could take to, you know, eliminate or reduce the hangover effects. And I, I've tried it enough times to go, this is revolutionary. This is amazing. People mm -hmm. are going to love it when they try it. And I was sold on the company just from that. But after hearing him and what they are doing with other future just products, the tip of the iceberg. oh my God, it was just, it was a low hanging fruit. It was a, it was it was well, like a slam dunk deal for them to just start there, but it's nowhere well, near. Well, the science is wild. Like they literally, this is what they did with their current product that's out in market, and, and I want to explain this because it's wild science. They took bacteria and they modified it so that this bacteria produces compounds that break down acetaldehyde, which is this negative byproduct of alcohol. So what they did is they literally created, they modified bacteria to do what they wanted. And the science exists to be able to do this for lots of different things. So what you could do is you could create bacteria to theoretically, this is totally possible, to produce more serotonin, more dopamine, to produce anti-inflammatory compounds. Like the sky's the limit with what you can do with bacteria in that case. And now there's 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 complex things to do. For example, creating bacteria that helps with breaking down the negative byproducts of alcohol. Like, like you said, Adam, low-hanging fruit, very easy. You know, if I want to create a bacteria that helps with depression, well, that's a really complex. And we could eventually do it, but we have to address so many different things. It would be much more complex, much more, you know, difficult. But, yeah, uh, this is remarkable. I think this is a field of science that's going to explode. Yeah, I agree. So what we, do you think about the whole new class of what do you, uh, pharmaceutical? What do you guys think about the future application with things? Because what went through my head when I was listening to that was, like, my struggle with psoriasis and autoimmune stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, and trying to figure out what is happening chemically in my body that causes this autoimmune reaction. And what if we could genetically modify a bacteria that actually combated that regardless of the food I ate. So if we could if we could isolate and figure out what it is that causes this autoimmune reaction and then you could actually gen genetically modify a bacteria that I would ingest. Totally. I mean that's imagine what I mean we're just talking about psoriasis my and my single issue the, the, that I'm dealing with. It's because your your bacteria, your flora, right? Your um the, the bacteria that lives in your body and on your body 
is it's considerate. And he said this, I think, in the podcast. It's like another organ. It's mm-hmm. another organ yeah. of the human body. And it's responsible for influencing lots and lots and lots of different functions. To the point where we've connected bacteria to Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, heart disease, obesity, mm-hmm. depression, libido, inflammation. I'm like, you name it. There's been a connection somehow, and it's it's either a connection that is causing or it's a connection that's caused by particular situation. Nonetheless, they're connected. There's a there's mm-hmm. a there's a highway between the two, and so this science is remarkable, and it the potential, unless we really find out that there's no connection and everything we saw was garbage, which doesn't look that way, the potential is limitless to what can happen if as long as we can create the right you know type of bacteria and the right mechanisms. Remarkable. So yeah, when we talked to him, and because we like the product so much for the alcohol aspect, we're like, and literally, this is what we did. We sat down. This is true. Now, we sat down with him, talked with him more, loved the product. Oh, we've been work, you know working with you guys for a while. What's going on in the future? What's happening at the company? And we literally, he didn't approach us. We approached him. Can we invest in your company? Yeah. And he said, let me see if we can work something out. Well, so. more remarkable, limitless, fascinating things. I'm so hung up on this metaverse NFT. I, right I know now. you love it. I, it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's so fascinating to me right now what people are doing. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I have a lot, I have a lot of family and friends that are connected to me that are, are going in on all this stuff. I just, are they really? Oh yeah. Buying NFTs here and there and just, now they're expecting to sell it later for higher. I mean, yeah, it's all speculation. It, that's all it is. It's not a hard asset. It's you're completely speculating on that. If things go the direction, Didn't someone you, sell like NFT real estate, yeah, for like 2.4 million. So now here's the thing that's trippy. And I, somebody's explained this to me because it doesn't make any sense. Theoretically in the metaverse, there's a limitless supply of real estate, right? It's not like real real estate. Theoretically, but think of it like more like a video game, right? So at least this is how I and please yeah. correct me if I'm wrong and like my my because I don't fully understand this. But imagine if um uh, the the a level or a a the, the a place in the video game is for sale. Mm-hmm. And this place in this video game, say level 1, has you know Nike and uh, Great America theme oh, park. You, you'd want to make sure though. You want to be real in that estate. You're close yeah. to that. Yeah. Right? So for example, like Nike. I get it. Nike just bought real estate in Roblox. So Nike yeah. is now invested in oh a my God, part. Dude. Video game makers can drum up but so that much makes money sense now. Yes. because yeah, they can outfit the their characters it's, with right. Their clothes. And, and, so, and think about how like like Starbucks. One of Starbucks strategies in the real world uh, when they put up a store is they put them all by McDonald's. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know that or, or not, but that's like one of their strategies is just they know that like if that that the type of clientele that is attracted to going to McDonald's stuff like that they're going to get. I've heard of that. I've heard also businesses look for Whole Foods because Whole Foods right. is a good job. Yeah. But, so uh, there's okay. just so imagine if you're if you if if Nike buys real estate in 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 this you know video game metaverse world how valuable real estate will be right next door so mm-hmm. your little avatar guy goes into nike does all the cool nike things and he goes right next door to your store or whatever so well, think about that think was. about this the video games we played when we were kids like mario brothers yeah. think of the levels that are the most popular yeah how much each level would cost there's some levels that suck nobody really cares about that that's one. right well there's, that's the thing i mean you're gonna want you're gonna want something where there's foot traffic uh, you know virtually otherwise it's gonna be completely worthless well that's the part that is risky right now yeah. right so if you're you, guessing yeah you're guessing and but i mean if if someone like nike okay which is a billion dollar like company goes into a place and invest a significant amount of money, it's probably a pretty safe bet that if you bought some real estate nearby it, that now here's, by proxy, you're going to do well. Right? Now, here's my question. So, okay, so it's no different than a sponsor buying real estate on our podcast. We're going to talk about a sponsor. They pay us money, so they're going to pay a video game for real estate mm-hmm. on a particular level. Here's my question, though. What control do you own as the owner of that real estate? Let's say you own you know, level six of Roblox or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if there's levels, but let's just say you own something like that. Does that then mean you can rent your space out? Does that mean you can right. that Roblox is still going to develop video games on it? Or Do that, you own the air above it if there's air? That's one hundred percent right. Yeah, like, like how does that? Things. I guess it's different from. I would imagine it's different from space to space. I would imagine that too. Like I don't know. I don't know exactly. I mean, what I, the value that I would see in it, and I don't think you could buy like a whole a whole level. Or sure. Like maybe they wouldn't allow. Maybe there's like they wouldn't allow the like Roblox wouldn't allow you to own the whole level. Right. They would want the rights to to that. But a, a part of the real estate within a level makes sense because maybe it's you like, could brand the whole thing. Well, yeah, you you do you brand like if you look up maybe Doug can pull up Nike Nike Mikey Nike, Mikey, Mikey Partners. Likes it. 
Nike partners oh, with cool. Roblox, and you can see what they did. And it's like a, a whole experience. Your little avatar goes through so Nike, it's Nike Land. Land. And it's all branded Nike Land. I mean, there's Nike stuff everywhere and trying on shoes and doing all stuff. Oh, my God. And then so, Nike's now selling the kids or whoever's playing yes. Nike NFT shoes. Right. And um, Exactly. They can buy. And then and so that's the Skins. thing. That's the thing. I'm telling you guys, you're going to be able. Okay, there you go. Oh, right. Nike Land and Roblox. There you go. Wow. wow. Right? So it's just a great way for branding. I'm sure you're going to be able to buy NFTs there, which, you know, when we get into the AR world, I mean, this is around the corner, right? Being able to wear these Google glasses or whatever they're going to be, whoever brands them first or does well, is I'll, we could be sitting here right now and you guys have your normal outfits on. Yeah. That I see in the world, and then I'm going to put my glasses on and I'm going to see your virtual outfits right. that you are going to be able to buy. And what's going to, just like in the real world, okay, there's people that spend thousands of dollars on a pair of sneaky, sne sneaky, sneaky, I don't know what's up with <laughs> Sneakies and goo goo gagas. Can I speak Bro. to that? I don't know what's going on. Hey, hey. what did you eat this? Did you I don't know. I didn't have, you need, have, you need, I need more magic spoon. Yeah, I, I put on my sneakies. <laughs> you got to have more protein in your breakfast. Eat that magic spoon. No, dude. Cereal. So, there's people that will spend that kind of money. You like that commercial, huh? Uh, <laughs> no, that wasn't I, a good place for it. That would have been a better like for pure. I was trying to think like about that. how we would construct our little metaverse like plot a land with all of our sponsors and everything, and like you know maybe there's like a huge bowl. Well, no, we okay, another great example. Imagine we build our own virtual space and world that lives within the metaverse. And then we can sell real estate to our partners. Our partners already pay us yeah. money to have real estate on the podcast. If we made this place, you know, Mind Pump Land, a fun place for people to be at, and there's <laughs> yeah. traffic hey, in this. What would Adam Land look like? I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I mean, I've already, I've already came out and said that I would be a part of the unplugged people. So I'm fascinated by all this stuff. Uh, would I dabble in it? Absolutely. I don't believe Am you. I, you know why I don't believe you? Why? Because if it turns into a massive business investment well, okay. opportunity. That's fair enough. Fair enough. There's no way in hell okay. Adam yeah. Land is not going to exist. You wouldn't be able to sit idle by. So, okay. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, I I could see myself participating in it for the business reasons only. Yeah. Like I, you like, wouldn't play in Adam Land. You would just well, I mean, it's, it's look at it. Look at it's even how I watch my, myself and how I monitor Instagram today. Like, yeah. The, okay. I turned on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, with the intentions of, I didn't know it was going to be mind pump, but building a a digital uh, e-commerce business. Sure. That was yeah. the plan the very first time I posted the very first stupid picture on Instagram and Facebook. That was the real reason why I did it. Now, over the last eight, nine years that I've been on there, I've I've fallen prey to the same trap that all the other people do, where it sucks you in, and, and all I'm doing is scrolling and looking at booty pics and bullshit and things that are not feeding my soul or making me grow or be a better person. Mm -hmm. And so I have to ma monitor this yeah. stuff and regulate how much I'm in it. I don't think it's going to be any different for this metaverse. I think it's going to be just like another one of these things that people love to escape and go to. And if you're not self-aware enough to catch yourself, so I, I will probably dabble in it the same way, but then also have this plan of, I don't want to get stuck in this. Yeah. this I metaverse. feel like I could describe mine if you guys are just oh, land. Yeah. Hell yeah. 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 So it's like this huge forest of, you know, cheese trees uh <laughs> and your lumberjack and you, your your axe actually is like a, a guitar that plays metal and uh and your avatar is your, yeah you can be a jedi whenever you want oh wow yeah <laughs> i'll play that I, right yeah i feel fun. like mine would be boring you know what i mean hey come to sal land and yeah it, i'll answer sardines and you know, it's your I'll science confidently, questions i'll confidently answer your questions whether i'm right or wrong that's right hey speaking of instagram did you guys see i rolled over uh uh Three figure was a hundred thousand followers. Such a depressing day. For wow. Me. Such a depressing what a, day. Who cares? That's, <laughs> you know what's funny? Wow. Of all people, you know, people in the social, like in the influencer people business, that, yeah, want to be It's cool, such a big it's deal. Insulting. It's not a big deal. It doesn't mean that much at all. Actually, of all the things that we do, that's the least. I mean, it means you're the most popular yeah. of the four of us. Nah. So, I mean, it does on mean Instagram. That. Yeah. 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 You, you better own that. Yeah. 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 Except, yeah. When, except whenever Start we acting show. Like it. No, I'm gonna call you out, Justin. I don't care where we go in the Stop. real world. No, you can't. You can't do it anymore. You're hundred thousand followers. Listen, that's dude, it's bullshit. Confirmed. We show up everywhere. Doesn't matter where. It's fact. Yeah. Adam and I will go to speaking engagements, and they're all. And, and we'll joking? ask him on purpose. <laughs> yeah, it's because I'm not there. That's well, the hey, reason. Ray, uh, 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 raise your hand. Tell us who your favorite host is. It's always like eight of them are Justin. There's like yeah. one that's me, one that's yeah. Adam. But then if it's us three, then it's oh, it's Doug. Yeah, because yeah. like whoever <laughs> isn't there. No, yeah, is that your true. theory? That's my theory. That's not no. at all true. I think it, I think the order goes: you, then Doug, and then Sal and I are tied for last yeah. or third, however yep. you want to look at they're, it. Yeah. They're That's cheering just, for me and Doug. 
It's the it's the there's a love hate relationship that I think that comes with with Sal and I. I yeah. think you're more likable in, mm. in the, uh, the S- super hate, likable. Love hate love. I mean, I love you. I mean, I'm drawn in totally. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Speaking of love, I got to get back to Magic Spoon. Yeah. Uh, so I had one of my I don't know if you guys met my buddy Dom. He came. He's an investment advisor. Super smart guy. Guy who came in the other day. Yeah. Love him. He's always giving me free uh, investment advice, uh, and he's into working out and training. And the guy's uh, Muay Thai. He fights Muay Thai. In fact, when I held pad for him once, and uh, that was the last time. The guy Oof. kicks like a horse, dude. Oh, yeah. Crazy genetics, too, by the way. He lifts weights for kickboxing, and the guy could squat four plates like oh, it's, like like it's no big deal. <laughs> anyway, he came in here because he was in the area, and he's like, hey, I've never seen your studio. I'm like, hey, come on by. And also, do you want any supplements? Because we have this back room, and because he's always giving me you know free advice. I'm like, let me give you some free stuff. So we're going through, and he looks up. He's like, cereal? Why do you guys have kid cereal in here? I'm like, bro, try this out. <laughs> Not just any kid cereal. Yeah, I'm like, try this out and and let me and let me know what you think. So anyway, he's the guy's ordered like like seven boxes. Like he went crazy. Yeah. He, he texted me and he's like, bro, this cereal is incredible. Are you sure that it's got a lot of protein? Well, I keep, yeah, I keep waiting for the bodybuilder because I mean it's so perfect for that. Because totally. you, you know all the different protein shakes everybody was trying to do. Um, you know, all those old flavors that we remember growing up, yeah. like Cinnamon Toast Crunch and whatever. I, I used to see all these flavors. I'm like, look, it's literally cereal uh, yeah. with the protein in it. So yeah. it's just like a perfect you know, no they, sugar. you know they have like a, a satisfaction guaranteed thing, right? So don't they, Doug, don't they, if you don't like the cereal, like mm-hmm. if you order from them, you don't like the cereal, they'll, you can send it back, yeah? Or yeah, refund, right? on your first order. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow, so they do good. a satisfaction guaranteed. So I think that's pretty cool. They have some of the highest ratings. Uh, if you look at their like star ratings or whatever, it's like- I mean, I feel like you can only do something like that if you know your shit, your product is the shit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you, otherwise you go broke giving everybody their money back who tries yeah. your product. So you, you count on that- 90 plus percent of you know, the people are going to love you it. You know, it's Dude. funny though. So my, so Dom, right? He's, he's not a fitness guy, but he works out. So he's like, bro, there's no sugar. It's high in protein. This is crazy. He's like, so can I get fat off this? I'm like, yeah, dude, you <laughs> could eat a whole box you know, every day <laughs> and your calories are too high. So you'll still, you still hey, gain weight. That but. is true. But if you did crush a whole box of Magic Spoon, it is still much lower in calories totally. than, than like a normal bowl of oh, a lot yeah, of regular really. Have you guys eaten a whole box at I once? Have. I have. At once? Not like, All at once? Not Probably at once. half a box. No, I've gone back and re- I've I've gone through a whole box. In a whole day? Yeah, yeah. And I've calculated it out. It's not that crazy amount of calories. It's how many? So how many grams of protein is it in a, like a serving that you would actually eat? Like 30 something? Oh, like that I would normally eat? Yeah. Like, oh, cause, at, cause at they give you that. a small serving, but you'll Yeah, get, no, at least that. No, I'm getting at least 40, 50 grams minimum. So mm-hmm. it's, and that's only like, uh, I want to say three or four servings worth. So, but I mean, come on. When you look at like serving size of cereal, nobody eats the serving size of cereal. I don't care healthy or not healthy. <laughs> no. Like you look you at- fill the bowl. Up, and I have dude. done this many times. And if you guys have never done this, do this. I think it's important you do this so you Actually measure what, what they say. Yeah, measure it so you can see what you're feeding your kids and yourself when you give them cereal. Like the back of boxes, most boxes are either a quarter cup, a half cup, or three quarters of a cup. Not even a cup. Mm. And one cup of cereal is nothing. No. Nobody mm. eats three-fourths a cup of cereal or a half cup of cereal. Everybody is eating two to three yeah. to four cups of cereal. Yeah, what does that so say, the, the same person eats two Pringles only. This yeah. is the peanut butter, 170 calories okay. per cup, one cup. How many cups in a serve, or how many servings per box? Five. So See? So, oh, five yeah. cups. so not even 1,000 calories. For a whole box of yes. How many grams of protein crazy. would that be? That's 14 grams, so that's uh, 70 grams of protein. Oh, wow. So 70 grams of protein Boop. under 1,000 calories. And it's whey protein. Yeah. It's really good protein. That's what I'm saying. It's not, I mean, I'm not encouraging people to binge eat or go eat a whole box of cereal, but yeah. my point is- Or you or, could do worse. You could, point. you could smoke a joint, do that, and watch cartoons. It's a good time. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> the only thing it they're is. lacking is the little like plastic toy. Yeah, like, where, when are you going to come out of that, man? Can I, can I tell you something right now? That huh. closed me on cereal so many times. Yeah, dude. Kid. Did it really? It's a shitty toy. I'll take the cereal that is I like less than this one. So who hacked that first? Was McDonald's the first one to hack that? Does anybody know? Oh, the Bart meal? Simpson on a skateboard. Yeah, like who yeah. hacked yeah. the toy, giving toys away with food? Cracker Jacks, maybe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Doug Cracker is Jacks. right. Good call, old guy. That's a really yeah. cool yeah. reference. <laughs> yes, I yes. remember back in the day. <laughs> but it was black and white. I remember. <laughs> Before we could print in color. <laughs> You'd get a real rock. We were yeah. playing, we were what playing is, hopscotch. Hey, let's do a little Google search here. What is what is the... When did Crackle Jacks... Crackle. Boy, I am <laughs> fucked today. Ah, give, me, give me some pure. Give Skip me some. Blah, blah, blah. When did Cracker Jacks start? I think it was eight, it was in the 1800s. 
I want to say late 1800s. You Bro, lie. it was like World War II no, or something, right? Sal is right. 1893. Wow. wow. Oh well, hold on. God. Hold on. Where's that? Where's that? We're keeping track here, right, oh, Andrew? God, yeah, make sure you put that above my head. <laughs> inflated <laughs> inflated yeah, numbers. Yeah. yeah. Wow. No, wait, I, I knew that because it's an old ass it's a cereal. Wow. Really and it, really now, old. when it started, Doug, did it do? Did it come out the gates with the little toy and the? Remember they did tattoos in there? They oh, did, I remember oh, the fake the tattoos. tattoos. Yeah, yeah that's what that, that. That's I remember that in there more than anything else. I know they did other things. Well, I know base. Baseball cards would give you gum that would cut your face. Yeah, but that is go so back hard. to 1800s. Baseball cards have been around a long time. Dude. Not before 1800s. It was until 19, they were putting a temporary tattoo in your neck. Let's see, you're let's cool. see, Doug. So they started adding toys in 1912. Wow. Uh, Wow. And then That's, do when was gum in baseball cards? Or just baseball cards in general. I'd like to know when the first ones were sold. I want to say it was... No, it was 19-something. It was it? Yeah. Okay. Or oh, then we you were, had the Bazooka Joe. We weren't, playing, we weren't even playing professional baseball before that. Really? Yeah. God, Tell if me. I know more about baseball than you right here, oh, no. this will be terrible. Oh, my God. 18, Adam's 1886. Wow, that's embarrassing, Adam. Yeah, now I have wow. to fucking that fact check you, Doug. That is not true. Put the sports ball... Uh, Tell me... By the way, that's why I have this jersey right here. When did professional... When <laughs> he's gonna, yeah. he's gonna go, he's gonna, I got a fact check, Doug. Here, just, you think Doug's on my? I'm gonna slip him a ten afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Doug, anytime I have you oh, fact check, you must be using Yahoo. Wow, yeah. I yeah. did not know. Yeah. That. 1869. Yeah, I'm seeing different numbers here. It's yeah, America, no, I'm, it's I'm, America's uh, pastime. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Oh, you ones. know what? It, you know the major league baseball started in 1903. That's why. Mm. Okay, I, I concede. <laughs> wow, I didn't know. I didn't know that. So, okay, when did, now? When did the the gum and baseball cards were what? Yeah. Well, before we get there, MLB was started in 1869 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. So, well, I, I got think, 1903. Wasn't that, that the Reds? Cincinnati, Cincinnati. Reds. <laughs> yeah. no. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop. You're, you're really, <laughs> just quit while you're ahead right wow. now. You yeah. want a sports bet? Here's wasn't it the really Cincinnati really Bumblebees? Wasn't that the name of that? <laughs> you win all everything today. 100 subscribers. All the teams were racist names back then, though. So who knows? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so tops ba baseball cards added chewing gum back in 1938. Wow. wow. That's not, that's so not Cracker Jacks was first. Doug was like thirty five. So cra <laughs> Cracker Jacks was yeah, the first, yeah. the first one to do that. Well, the, the the bubble gum in baseball cards, and I'm gonna tell you something. Nobody know people watching this now, unless you're as old as we are, you have no idea. It was harder than the cards themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was yeah. it was crunchy, sharp. You yeah, bite it and yeah. be like, be careful. You'd have to chew it for a second before mm -hmm. the the, the yeah, saliva and the mixed flavor was gone in thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Uh, I got I got to correct myself here. So Tops was also a chewing gum company. So oh. they started back in nineteen thirty eight, and they actually started mm. selling baseball oh, card packs, packs smashed themselves with a yeah. stick of gum included in nineteen fifty one. What? A, oh. That's brilliant. I didn't know. So that. was Tops the first baseball card company? Oh, okay. I <laughs> no, I believe so. I they call me guy. Mr. Google. Yeah. It's wild. So, yeah. so I remember, so these are the baseball card companies. Because I used to buy baseball cards Score, all the time. Upper Deck. Score, yeah. Upper Deck, Donruss. Yeah, those that was came one. later. Those all Tops. Came. And then uh, what was the one that everybody- Fleer? Fleer? Wasn't there one that everybody was like, this is the expensive one? Upper Deck. Was yeah. it Upper Deck? Yeah, Upper Deck was the expensive card. Upper Deck, by the way, a great prank you can pull on yeah. your friends. Look that up. Throw an Upper Decker in there. So the oldest company was Peck and Snyder back in 1868. Gee, you wonder why they didn't succeed. Schneider. Mr. Peck. Have you guys are you guys watching th that market by the way? It's every every market. No, you said it it is it like is gone insane. in value. Bro, literally. I have grown ass friends that are in their 40s that are waiting in target lines on Tuesdays. Yeah. Can you how can you tell me that we're not in a bubble without telling me we're in a bubble? You I know. know. I, mean? yeah. I can literally take money. You can name 85 markets, and I could just throw it at it. Grown men not just going to work for the me. day so they can wait in Target line to buy baseball cards. Oh. Just, just tell me Ken Griffey Jr.'s upper deck you know, rookie card's finally worth something. No. Do you have that? No. It's, it's still not. Oh, it's not because like they, you know what ten happened? Ten of them. That's what, okay, so that, that's what crashed, and there's a good, uh, I think it was a Netflix documentary on the kind of the whole evolution of baseball cards and, like, and then the market and then the crashing of it. And what happened was baseball cards got greedy. They were making because these companies were making so much money. King Griffey Jr. bought the, the, an example of that. That so card. what you're saying is they printed so many, it inflated yep. the mm -hmm. circulation of them, Those thus lowering of the value. Exactly. Wow, that sounds like so now, some other shit that they're doing. So right. now the now why it is they they learn from that. That's what crashed the market. So cards now that are being made are very limited, and so that's what's part of what's driving this the price yeah. up to them. So I, I have two cards that I think are worth money. I have. Um, Troy Aikman's rookie card score, 
and then Barry Sanders rookie card score. Doug can look it up. Yeah, so maybe mint someone. condition. Yeah, they're. I mean, <laughs> I think they're mint. Work today, Doug. I put them in the hard plastic case. You know, that you press yeah. them together and you. So, put the, like, Mark what you McGuire. have to do now is you have to send them in to get them graded. So if you really want to make any money off of them or them to be worth anything in the future, you have to go get them professionally graded. And they'll actually seal them themselves and they'll give you a score. And right now, good money is only being paid for like 10 mint. Perfect. A perfect card, which really? are rare. Sorry, so they, they already limit the amount of the, you know. The, oh, shit. I have that exact card. Look at that. Huh. $1,500. Yeah, right. So two dollars and eighty-seven eight cents here. So okay, so here's the thing: which you got to pay attention to, though. See how there's one for two dollars. Like so the one that's really expensive, if Doug clicked on it, you'll see how that's up in the on the top. It'll be like super. That's the grading. That's the grading system, and so I guarantee that's like a ten a ten mint. And the likelihood that you there, yeah, see PSA ten. See it says PSA ten. That's why it's worth so much money because it's not only his rookie card, but it's in perfect condition. You could have like a seven, and that card's worth like hardly there. anything. Wow. Well, I'm not. I don't plan on selling. I know you don't I, care. I'm giving it's them like, to my my but son. You see has how them. that's all. See how the top is like that. Yeah. Has a barcode. I mean, I, I got to go look at them because from what I recall, it's pretty damn good. Well, it's cheap right. to have that done, and it's worth doing that. Doug, so look you, up Barry Sanders rookie card score. I want to see how much because that's the other one that I have <laughs> that's worth a lot. Uh, what a random two card you have. Yeah. This what? turned into antique roadshow. How'd you get sudden. those? How did I get? Th I used to buy. I used to collect. So I did. I had baseball cards, football cards, and stamps. How weird is that? That you collected something you don't even watch? Huh? I watched it for a second. You know, <laughs> I did. I <laughs> you watched put it in his bike, dude. Just to okay. Get come on, let me hear. Let me hear. How did watching? Wow! Look at Barry Sanders. Look at that one. Fifteen hundred dollars. Also. Yeah, but look at the holy shit! Thirty-five thousand dollars. That can't be right. Of course it's right. Oh. But it's also Guess who's at, gonna go check this shit out yeah. when he goes home today? See, okay, look at see that one says nine point five? Yeah. Five forty nine for the same card to thirty five thousand. That's how much that makes a difference. So a nine point five God let my shit be minty. Whoa. Right. <laughs> minty. <laughs> minty minty. What about okay. signed balls? I got a the the uh, A's uh, World Series, the entire team signed that. Yeah, wow. that could that could go up there could too. The whole uh, team was I want to get balls? back to oh, how you started watching football for a second. Where did that where in your life were you? Late eighties. I was a young kid. So what did it? What sparked it? What, what what makes nerdy Sal, who's reading encyclopedias every day, go? You know, I'm going to watch some football. Because in the neighborhood, in yeah. my neighborhood, I would when I would hang out with the kids in the neighborhood. There were two things that we did. One is I owned a pair of boxing gloves, and I also owned gloves that uh, fullbacks and running backs would wear. You know, the ones that they cover their hands with. Yeah. That kind of look like MMA gloves. And we would fight each other. So this is one thing that we did. <laughs> I had and I was the too. neighborhood champion. I used to knock people out. I was really? Time. Yeah, I swear to God. And the other thing that we would do is we'd get together and we would play street football. A Andrew's looking at me. He doesn't believe this story. Right? Those are true. <laughs> hey, hey, look at me. Look at if you knew me in the neighborhood, Reading champion. You could you hit DM DM Adam. Let him know what time it was. <laughs> so no, that's a true story. Swear to God. So okay, like, we okay. do that. We'd all get together and we'd do these big fights, and then we'd also play street football, which was basically two hand touch, or if it got aggressive, we would tackle each other in the street, and we would play. So for a second, and then of course the 49ers in the eighties. We're so dominant. It was hard not to be a Bay Area kid and not get caught up on caught up in it. So I was like a, you know, Roger Craig and Joe Montana and okay. Jerry Rice yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know Rathman, all those guys. Like that was, and then what's yeah, his name? Dude. Bubba Paris, who played for the. Okay, 49ers. so you his you, son went to school with us, and you so. wa you watched during that time, which is a great time to be watching and would yeah. hook most people. What made it fall out of favor for you? Why didn't you keep watching? I started lifting weights, dude. And oh, I got wow. into it. yeah, I loved I loved weights and I loved and then UFC. I watched the first UFC with my dad, so I've always liked uh, martial arts, grappling especially, and uh, lifting weights. And I and oh, here's the other thing. I played. I told my mom I wanted to try tackle football. I think I was in eighth grade. I think so. And I'd never played real tackle football before. And I went to two practices, and the coaches. Fucked us up bad, and I remember being like, "I don't want to do this anymore, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Cancel it immediately. This is too much. This is not fun. I don't know what's going on." I, uh, I had a bad experience. Uh, I had the opposite reaction like to that. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ooh, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> I can fucking slam myself and my head into everybody. Yeah. Oh no, dude! They beat the shit out of us, and I mean, we didn't even tackle each other. We were just no. Uh, the coaches were throwing dicks up, back and then. the coach was like, "Keep going." Yeah. I'm like, "This is not healthy." Bro, I can't this be coach used to go around like pull the hairs out of my legs as I'm like trying to uh, get in stance. We never were allowed water, you know, and then they would just put us in a bull in a ring like as much as possible where you just go head to head and just smash and each you other. loved it. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So yeah. much yeah. hate and anger in his life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's good. I All was right. loved, so I didn't like. Justin's was like, I can hurt people. <laughs> I can hurt people, and you'll tell me good job Listen, for it. Yeah, you can <laughs> let can out keep- the darkness. It's fun. Look, here's the deal. Uh, you eat a healthy diet. Maybe you eat a high protein diet because you want to build muscle, or you want to help keep your appetite down. That's what protein does. Um, maybe you're bulking, trying to speed up your metabolism. But you have digestive issues. You're having issues breaking this food down and assimilating. Well, one thing you can try are digestive enzymes, but not just any digestive enzymes. You want to get digestive enzymes from a company that understands fitness and health and performance-minded individuals. This is why we partnered with Masszymes. They make digestive enzymes for fitness and performance-minded individuals. It's the only digestive enzymes that I use for when I eat food for my gut issues, and it makes a big difference. Go check them out. Head over to masszymes.com. That's M A S S Z Y M E S dot com forward slash mind pump. And then use the code mind pump 10 for 10% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Mark from New Jersey. Mark, what's up, man? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Um, so I've been uh, working out uh, and playing competitive sports probably for over 20 years now. And I'm finding that. Uh, it takes a bit longer to uh, recover, and I'm I'm looking at different you know kind of different uh, schemes methodologies to to actually get to the point where I can keep doing what I'm doing without feeling like I did a thousand deadlifts the day after I play a soccer game. Um, so I, I've been looking into one of the things I looked into was uh, Doug Brignoli's um, his workout plan where it's mostly like it's pure isolation. And I'm just wondering what you guys, I know it's leaving a lot on the table as far as CNS signaling and stuff like that, but I'm wondering what you guys think about that as like a uh, kind of a prehab rehab kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So that's a good question. All right. So first and foremost, there are corrective type exercises that are used to connect to certain muscles that you may have issues firing or connecting to. During certain movements, physical therapists use movements like this all the time. They're not traditionally the bodybuilder isolation movements, but they are isolation movements nonetheless. And in that particular application, there's some value, but the goal is not to stay in there, but rather to use those movements as a way to get the person to move better in you know more complex movements because you know everyday life involves lots of complex movements and very little kind of single joint isolation type movements. Now, the guy you're referring to, I'm I'm familiar with, and his approach is somewhat like this. I go to the doctor and I say, hey doc, um, my knees bother me when I squat. And so the doctor says, oh, don't squat anymore. Or I say, (laughs) hey doc, my knees, you know, my ankles bother me when I walk a lot. And the doctor says, yeah, yeah, don't walk a lot anymore and, and it'll stop hurting. Now, Part of that's true. You stop doing what's bothering you and you'll start to feel better. But here's the problem with that. You start to lose the ability to do the other stuff and you're not addressing really the root cause. The root cause of a lot of these issues isn't the necessarily the exercise like squats or deadlifts, but rather the improper application or lack of connection, lack of mobility, your inability to stabilize, or maybe your inability to recover because it's too much intensity in combination with all the other stuff that you're doing. So nothing necessarily wrong with this approach, but it's definitely going to result in your in you losing the ability to do what you what you can probably do right now or just going further down that path. So I don't think isolation movements are key. Complex movements are. You just got to be able to do them right and you have to address the issues that are preventing you from doing them properly and then apply them properly. You might just be applying too much intensity in the context of your overall lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm always I'm always torn with um, with questions like this and and this approach. Like, I don't necessarily disagree with uh, his philosophy on on training because I think there's a majority of people that don't know how to apply intensity correctly. To your point, Sal, and so a safer, easier way to do that is let's just focus on isolation movements and, and it's build. more controlled. It is, and, and it, it's a it's a, a lot easier not to overdo it and hurt yourself because it's an isolation exercise versus something that's like a big compound movement. That being said, I, I think that there's tremendous value in training these compound lifts, but just understanding that where you're at in your life, like the way I train a compound lift, even today, just at 40, and I'm not 50, right? So. I, I approach it different than when I just did that I did ten years ago. Ten years ago, I was I was so uh, infatuated with how much more weight can I put on my back. Where when I squat today, I I care more about the movement. You know, how does it feel as I go through the squat? 
And that the, that load could be 100 plus pounds less than what I was doing just five, 10 years ago. Now, do I look at it and go, oh my God, I'm so much weaker than I was before? Like, no, it's not like that. Just I have different goals in my life. I'm older. I'm a father now. I'm not trying to prove anything to anybody. I've already built the best physique I could probably ever build on my body. Like, I'm just not at that place in my life anymore. But I And I don't want to lose the skill of being able to squat ass to grass or deadlift good amount of weight. But I, but I also don't need to lift the most in, in, in the room anymore either. So my approach towards those movements is just different. I just I, I, I look at it like the, the skill of the movement. And if, if it's off at all or I feel like it's wearing on my body, that's always a great indicator that, okay, I'm not addressing mobility in my hips or, oh, I need to work on my ankle mobility more. And I use squatting and deadlifting, overhead pressing, these movements as great. In fact, yesterday I was... I hadn't done a barbell overhead press in literally maybe a month. And I was it was actually really hard for me to extend my arms all the way over my head. And I was doing a 45, just the bar, you know, mm-hmm. even though I've shoulder pressed 225 over my head, I'm not, I don't care about that right now. What I noticed was, oh, wow, my lats are really tight. I have a hard time fully extending right now. And now it's an indicator for me to go back, use my my MAPS Prime Pro program and address some of my immobility in some of my shoulder and potentially tightness in my lats. And so I use these compound lifts today to be a gauge of improving my movement, not so much how much can I hammer the body. And so that's my one thing I don't like about programs that decide to just dismiss these these movements mm-hmm. that are fundamental. Yeah, and I'll, I want to add something too. In terms of like the isolation movements, it's a great helpful tool for uh, coaches uh, to be able to identify, you know, uh, like a disconnect. So if, if, if there's a muscular disconnect there, if there's a lagging body part, if there's, you know, some kind of a lack of like mind muscle connection, uh, you know, we could sort of microscope zoom in and, and see, you know, how to address that and I think it's a very uh, helpful way to kind of you know bring that back uh, for the overall but uh, if you stay and you live in that type of, of methodology you're going to create more dysfunctions for you like think about the overall patterning of movement uh, and, and how your body is is able to organize itself uh, you know for the overall you're going to have you know issues with that when you come back to you know your sports specifically so this is one thing that really irritates me uh, is when I see you know athletes go into this direction of isolated movements and they come back to perform and there's just so many dysfunctions to to deal with it and address at that point well yeah. there's no there are no isolation isolated movements in no, sport it's, <laughs> it's in any movement compound yeah in any move okay so here's here's the i'll give you an analogy mark just kind of illustrate this comparison this false comparison that certain people will make so let's say um i say okay hitting a nail with a rock is far more effective than using a hammer. And you think to yourself like, what? How is that even possible? And then I show you the comparison. On the one hand, we got a person using a rock to hammer the nail. On the other hand, we got someone throwing a hammer at a nail across the room. Well, yeah, in that case, the the rock is going to be more effective. If I compare a leg extension to a crappy squat with poor mobility and no connection, yeah, the the leg extension is going to be safer and better than a crappy, poor connection, lack of mobility squat. So that's a false comparison. We got to compare good to good, right? Like a, a good, and, and I, I've heard, and I, if I'm not mistaken, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but Doug Brignoli will refer to like isolation movements as being more efficient than compound lifts or compound lifts are inefficient, right? Well, it's that there's a lot of load that does not go into the target muscle, yeah. essentially. That's that's not how the body works. I, I, and I, I get what he's saying. Uh, mm-hmm. In a lab, we can measure that but it doesn't translate into the real world. There isn't a single serious lifter in any strength sport or even bodybuilding that's going to say a leg extension is going to build your quads more than any pick your compound lift, lunges, barbell squats, leg press, hack squat, I don't care. No one's going to no one's going to say that. We know that. We know in practice that the compound lifts just they just are far more effective. Um, you know, when, when we're comparing apples to apples, but at the end of the day, Mark, what, what you want to look at is, okay, why are these compound lifts hammering my body so much? Why are they making me feel terrible? It's not the lifts. It's how you're performing them. And it's also, it's how you're applying them, what kind of intensity, your form, your technique and your connection. If you fix those things, you'll get phenomenal results out of those compound lifts. But here's the best part, Mark, the pursuit of fixing those things will also get you amazing results. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you have to wait for a year before you could do a really good squat or a really good deadlift. 
your pursuit of getting there is going to still get you phenomenal results versus I only do these isolation exercises, in which case you actually slowly lose your ability to do gross motor movements because gross motor movements or movement in general involves muscle. Okay, that's true. Muscles have to contract, but there's skill involved. There's the way the muscles fire and work together. That's why a somebody who lifts a lot of weight in the gym isn't going to feel as strong on the mat as a trained wrestler, right? The, the wrestler is going to have smaller muscles. Each muscle probably contracts with less force individually than a bodybuilder. But man, when they grab you, they know how to apply it. They know how to use leverage. There's a skill involved. And it feels like they're a lot stronger. Anybody who's ever trained in, in mixed martial arts will tell you this. So so that's what you want to focus on. And, and, and there are lots of people in our space who take – what they do is they take this kind of aesthetic-minded bodybuilder mentality. They go extreme with it. And then because they're smart, they can articulate it in a very misguided uh, way that sounds kind of smart. So the average person listens and goes, wow, yeah. that kind of it's makes convincing. sense. And, oh, let me look at a picture of the guy. Oh, he's ripped. So maybe yeah. he knows what he's talking about, which uh, I'll tell you right now, in my space, <laughs> there's a lot of really ripped-looking people that know well, nothing <clears throat> about I don't think I don't think it's just that either. I think it also matters what Mark's specific goals are. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that w with your athletic background that you don't want to lose uh, that ability to do some of those things, or you at least want to keep it as long as you can. And yeah, uh, and, and, indefinitely. Right. So I am. So that that's the part I think is the most important of this conversation, because be, be honest, there's nothing wrong. With, I, I used to I used, ironically, I was more this guy when I was younger, where I used to say, I'm all show no go. I just want to look good. No girls ever ask me how much I bench when I take my shirt off. Mm. So that was my mindset as a young kid. But it's different now today. Today, I care more about being able to get down, sit down all the way on the ground and play with my son uh, without feeling like my back is on fire, or my knees or my hips are on fire. So different goals in my life. So that matters here. Right. And if you are a guy that it likes to move and likes to do active things and you want to keep that as long as you can, then I, I definitely would not want you to eliminate certain movements like a, a squat or a deadlift or overhead press. I, but I would, I would know, I would know this because I've trained many people like you that are at, have an athletic mindset. And I know that how you do anything is how you do everything. And the one thing I'd probably have to keep reminding you is Mark, don't get competitive with yourself here. Don't try and keep adding weight to the bar Get, if you're going to get competitive with anything, get competitive with how well you're moving the bar. Yeah, right. pra practice the lifts. Don't train the lifts. Like, like think that way. Like I'm going to go in the gym and I'm going to practice these movements like you would be practicing a throw or a swing to get really good at them. And then I'll use one more analogy, uh, again, just to kind of hammer this home. Imagine if you were in a laboratory and you're, the scientist studying you said, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're not going to walk at all for the next three years. We're not going to allow you to walk at all. However... We're going to train all the muscles involved in walking in isolation. So you're going to do calf raises, leg extensions, leg you know curls, hip abduction, hip adduction. We're going to work all the muscles in isolation, but for three years, you're not going to walk at all. How well do you think you'll walk at the end of that three years? Yeah, it's it's horrible. And also, I guess the, the the if you follow this origin to insertion theory to you know the conclusions that have been drawn, um, you wouldn't lift you wouldn't do overhead lifts, which seems very dysfunctional. Yeah, 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 again, hundred percent. Yeah, there's a lot. Like, look at real world practice. Don't don't forget that pretty much all movement is a skill that can be learned and forgotten. So it's not just as easy as looking at a muscle. Yeah. Look at it's contraction. not just muscle contraction. You know, there's there's more to the story here. And I think a better approach would be to if if you need a break from compound lifts and really address any kind of imbalance or dysfunction, you know, go for a while doing unilateral training. I was going to ask that. Yep. Yeah, focus on that a while. It's really going to highlight a lot of the imbalance and things that will just present itself to you. You'll get better at that. You you know spend some time there. You bring it back to bilateral you know compound lifts, and you're going to notice a massive difference that being said too i don't and, and to your point justin and mark there is there's nothing wrong with this either it, it this isn't in uh in either or or ours or his it's like there's nothing wrong with you running an, an, an isolated program like this for a small period of time i just sure. mm -hmm. I, I would i would discourage you of getting ri getting rid of compound lists because of one person's philosophy like i definitely don't disagree with Hey, for two or three months, if you want to run all isolation exercises for a while to see how you feel and then to come back to those movements and see, wow, did they get better? Did they get worse? Do I like the way I feel? Do I like the way I look? Do I like what I see happening? Like, 
I don't see anything wrong with that. I would just discourage any of my clients from completely eliminating these movements in fear of like, oh, there the movement is what's hurting my back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cycling totally makes sense. Cool. All right. Well, cool. Mark, thanks for calling in. And do you have access to Maps Prime Pro? Because I feel like that would help you a lot with regardless of what workout you're doing. Yeah, I went on a, a spending spree over uh, during your Black Friday sale. So oh. I, I picked up uh, Prime, Prime Pro, Pro and uh, your RGB bundle. Oh, oh. excellent. Oh, so yeah, yeah use, up, use Prime and Prime Pro. I don't care what workout you're following. You follow Doug. Set or them ours. up in the forum, Doug. And uh, if you're not in our private forum, that's good, Adam. Let's, let's, let's get you in there so we can follow okay, along. Okay, perfect. All right, thanks, Mark. Awesome, Thank you, Mark. thanks, guys. No problem. Yeah, I... Uh, Boy, does this! I, it's hard not to get annoyed when I hear stuff like this because <laughs> I know, you kind of hear it in our voices a little bit. Well, you know what the problem? You know, it's the problem is I, I we take very much a lot of pride in what we do right. in helping people, and we know that this message there's some truth in it, but we also know how people hear it and then what they end up doing with it, mm -hmm. and it's going to do a, a huge disservice. There's an old saying in fitness, which is "use it or lose it," right? And it's a it's this old thing we used to say in the gyms all the time. I mean, in fact, when I was younger, I had no idea what the hell it meant. Well, literally, what it means is you stop training something, you stop doing something, you lose the ability to do it. Yeah, that's the bottom line. I mean, again, like the example I gave with not walking for a few years, even if all the muscles stay strong and you can contract them independently, you will lose a significant uh, percentage of your ability to walk and, and, effectively. And that is, it happens faster the older we get. So I, oh, yes. that, the reason why great I, point. it was so crazy, this was literally yesterday. So a great question to address right now, because I was actually kind of blown away by how difficult the overhead press was for me last mm -hmm. night. I mm -hmm. was like, holy shit. Like it's only been like a month. I yeah. feel like it's like been a month that I didn't do that movement, yeah. but because I don't do anything else that supports that movement to, to be able to extend fully over my head like that my body starts to prune it way faster today than what it did when yep. I was in my 20s. And I, he's in his 50s. So if you just decide, I'm not going to overhead press or I'm not going to deadlift or I'm not going to squat, it does not take very long before your body says, hey, we don't need to be able no, to do this No, you know skill. why? It's because as you get older, efficiency becomes a much more important survival, uh, survival mechanism. 100%. No, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I see that. I saw it last night. You know, I constantly get reminded of that. And so this was a great timing for this because I was like, wow, what that is crazy. I mean, I was doing the bar. No, I, yeah. I could I did not go over the bar. And I'm telling you, I was sweating just to yeah. to get the full extension, stabilize, come back down. Yeah. And it blew my mind. Well, this is also I get irritated because you see a lot of like uh, muscle activation type of um, testing and you can get some cool data from it. But that's not considering the overall. That's not it's it's the same problem I have a lot with with health where you see practitioners. They know one specific area of the body, one system so well, but they don't consider how everything is interconnected. And, and this is just another one of those examples from fitness where you need to consider how everything else is interconnected, especially function. Especially a guy like this, because your goal does matter here. If he came on and says like, Adam, I don't give it. I don't got kids. I don't give a shit about sports. Yeah. I just want to look good. I just want right? to, I just want to look good. Yeah. And every time I try and work on these squats or try and do these things, I keep running into these issues. You know, maybe that I look at that and go like, look, if you don't really give a shit about not being able to get down to the ground or not being able to do some of those movements and you literally just want to look good, well, then that's I, I, that's an okay approach to do that. Yeah, you're still going to lose the, the 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 incredibly profound effects of those exercises on changing how your body looks. Fair, fair. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think that's fair, mm -hmm. but I also think that there's there's many ways to skin a cat, and if your desired outcome is just to look a certain way, you can you can achieve that by not doing those movements. But it's like I don't when you ask people deeper. And they have to say things like, like for example, if you ask me, like, well, Adam, do you care if you, you can't lift something over your head ever again? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, and, I, and even though I might have said, oh, I just want to look really good, and I think about, it, I'm like, well, I don't want to actually not be able to do that. that that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, be honest. No. Our next caller is Aaron from New Hampshire. Aaron, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, what's up, boys? How you doing? Good, good, good. good man. Hey, before I jump into my question, I wanted to say that I'll be at the NCI conference in Phoenix next week. So I was really excited to hear that Adam and Sal will be there. Yeah, yeah for right sure. On, man. Sorry, sure. sorry, hey. Justin's not coming. Hey, I know everybody's know. so sad about that. <laughs> make, make sure nobody sure wants to hear me talk. Dude. Make sure you come up and say hi for sure then. Yeah, absolutely. I will. Uh, so just a little bit of context before I jump into my question. I've been training for 10 years and I got into fitness for the same reason as many people, which is that. I had some body image issues, which really trace back to middle school when I was overweight. And ever since I got into training, I've been an avid consumer of health content, including Mind Pump. So I've listened to you guys since 
2016 and I never miss an episode. And I think between the show and the YouTube channel, I think I've probably consumed just about everything that you guys have put out. And I've also run through several of the MAPS programs. So the past year has actually really been a big turning point for me on my health journey. I turned 30 years old and I also had my first kid, which was my son. And with that, I committed to finally overcoming my body image issues and to focusing on performance, which is something that I knew for a long time that I needed, but I'd just really been putting it off. And I got map screen and jumped into it. And it's really been awesome. I absolutely love it. It's my favorite maps program. And I can frankly say that I'm finally training because I love my body and not because I hate it. And I feel really confident in my physique and everything just feels really good right now. Um, I'm in fitness now for quality of life. I know Sal, you've talked a lot lately about how you're in fitness because of how it helps you excel and all the other parts of your life and because it's good for your mental health. And it's really the same way for me at this point, finally. Um, so I wrote into you guys because I have an interesting new challenge coming up, which is that I'll be having two hip surgeries over the next year. So I'm going to have limited access to my lower body, although obviously I'll be able to do some stuff with my upper body. So I'm just wondering what you guys think I should be focusing on from a, a training perspective during this time. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. You know, what's funny is that my, my answer is going to be different now than it would have been uh, even just 10 years ago. So studies are, are, there's some interesting studies on this and they've actually done this with people where they'll have one limb immobilized, like the left arm, and then they'll have the right arm not immobilized and they'll have the control group where they don't do anything with both arms and then they'll have the other group will, will train the arm that they can move to see if it creates a greater discrepancy, if it results in you know bigger imbalances or whatever. And, he, and what they found was when the people trained the arm that wasn't immobilized, it actually prevented some muscle and strength loss from the arm that was mobilized. Now, in the past, I would have told someone, don't train the parts of your body that can move because you'll create a bigger imbalance. Later on, it's harder to, to, to fix. That's not true at all. So when you aren't able to train your lower body, continue to train the parts of your body that you can. It'll actually prevent some strength and muscle loss in your lower body. And then before that, even more importantly, go into your surgery feeling strong and healthy because you're going to lose some strength and muscle. It's just going to happen. But the stronger you go into it, the, the fitter and more healthy you go into it, the better the recovery is going to be, uh, the better position you'll be in. And then, of course, don't forget about muscle memory. It's a real thing. It's very effective. It's really cool. So once you heal, you'll definitely notice, oh, my gosh, I lost a lot of strength and muscle. If you do everything right, it'll come back very quickly. And then the finally... Uh, creatine, the wonder supplement. They're, not, they're showing that creatine supplementation results in less muscle and strength loss uh, during recovery from surgeries than when people don't use it. So those will be the three things that I would recommend. What, Aaron, what did you say? When's the surgery coming up? December 28th. So it, it's a few weeks away. Oh, okay. So you are coming up close. Yeah. I mean, my advice would not be any different than Sal's. I mean, I really would, would just, the best thing you can do is to go into it with the most muscle. So staying consistent and building as much as you can going into that, so we could we can mitigate how much we lose. Uh, creatine will help doing will help doing that. But yeah, I would not stop. I just continue training uh, my upper body, working core, doing a lot of unilateral stuff. Uh, I would do that for my upper body, and then I wouldn't fret about what the muscle loss. That it's inevitable. It's going to happen because uh, it will. It'll come back pretty quick. And I think that's probably the most important part of this conversation. Is I would actually. Uh, I would love to follow up with you after the surgery mm -hmm. when it's time to get back into things with, cause to me, that will be the most important thing. And the, the thing that you'll have to be careful of is, uh, you know, we tend to have this tendency, especially when we've been consistently working out, you see, you lose this muscle, you start to feel better and then you can want to get after it right mm -hmm. away. And you kind of set yourself back. That's yeah. very common. Um, so to me, uh, what what you do afterwards is even more important than what you continue to do. Why? Because yeah, just do some upper body stuff, continue lifting. That's pretty general advice. 
But when you get out, how you're feeling, how you're moving, uh, and what we kind of focus on really, uh, really matters more. That's going to be the the hardest work is to to be able to control, you know, the tendencies of wanting to keep going because you felt good. You feel good right now, and you want to get back to that place. However, it may take a bit longer for you to heal and and be able to adjust. But uh, to find those thresholds and to kind of slowly kind of work your way in that direction, all of you know the those gains will come back. That's that's going to be inevitable. Just it's the gradual approach that's going to win you the longevity in uh, your pursuits for for maintaining this kind of fitness. Yeah, isometrics are really good, uh, by the way. When when you get to the point when you can start moving a little bit, isometrics, uh, you know, they're, they're safe because you're not moving through ranges of motion. They activate muscles. Are you going to have access to a, a good physical therapist afterwards, Aaron? Yeah, yeah. I'll be doing lots of PT. I've actually been doing PT for about a year and a half with him leading up to the surgery. So oh, I'll be doing PT. I also have a lot of equipment at home, a lot of dumbbells. Oh, dude. Have, now, do you have a therapist that comes to your house or do you go to a, a clinic? No, I, I know y'all are working with Luna now, but I actually go to an old school traditional PT. If you, if you want someone to come to your house, if you want to do supplemental physical therapy um, and it's super convenient, go to Luna. Um, they'll send someone to your house and they'll work with the current therapist. And I think it's probably going to be, still be covered. Uh, by insurance, but uh, I think th- your therapy is going to be key. A good physical therapist is worth their weight in gold when it comes to this kind of stuff. What, what are they telling you, Aaron? Uh, what's the time frame on that? I don't remember my last client that I trained with hip surgery. What's the time frame on recovery and getting back to things? So between the first and second surgery, there has to be at least four months that pass. He said probably somewhere between four to six months. And I'll probably be on crutches for about a month after each of them. They're not it's not as severe as a hip replacement because it's a bereavement, but probably about a month on crutches. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're going to be okay, but it's the, the struggle is going to be mental. That's going to mm-hmm. be the big struggle. You know, it's the in between aspect and, and stuff, but you'll bounce back quickly if you do everything right. Um, and you're, you sound like you're going into it pretty fit. So I think if anybody has chances of a really good full recovery, it's going to be someone like you. And I know that this isn't uh, advice related to really muscle and fat loss and, and movement, but you know when when I have situations that are uh, obviously I've never had hip surgery, but I've I've definitely had knee surgery and I've torn my Achilles and I've been basically locked down from doing some physical stuff. I, I always like to find um, another area in my life to put my energy and focus on it with growth related. Like so, uh, and that could be a lot of things. It could be diving into your relationship or to family stuff. It could be reading. Um, but find an area of of growth that doesn't you're not limited to by your legs and your movement to kind of focus your energy That's on, great so you don't get discouraged by what you can't do. And, you know, I, to me, like, that, that that's always been able to get me out of these places where I'm, I'm in, incapable of doing something or I'm limited because of something that I can't control. Uh, and then I, fo- I, I, I use that opportunity, like, well, I can't do any of my leg stuff right now. And I can't, instead of, and instead of dwelling on that, I'm like, well, you know, that opens the door for me where I would be training my legs at least, you know, two hours out of, out of a week. Now I'm going to read instead, or I'm going to do something else that is, that's going to grow me somewhere else in my life. And I think that does tremendous things for, for your overall health. So Adam, is there, is there anything in specific in the, uh, in the library that you'd recommend? Ooh, uh, Ooh. what are you into right now? Obviously you're into fitness. I get that, but that's, that's boring for me to read. So I, what do you, what do you else are you into? Or is there stuff that you're into with like, investing in finance or personal growth? Like where, where's your head at? Oh yeah. All of that. I'm also a marketing professor. So I do a lot of business books, but personal growth, finance, relationships, anything like that. Okay. Have you read the book Sway before? No. Check that out. So since you're into marketing and you like that, check the book Sway out. That was a fun read for me a um, long time ago. I forget the author. I'll have, maybe Doug will pull it up and then you'll, you'll catch a clip of it after we uh, post this up. But Start there and then, hey, message me. Uh, I, you know, people message me all the time about what they're reading and give me, I love to talk to people about what they're currently reading and give suggestions. So I do have plenty of suggestions, especially if you send me like over like three books that you really like. Uh, normally one of them maybe I've read or I, I'm familiar with them and I can give a good recommendation to something related to that. Awesome. Sway, I got it. All right, man. All right, man. Cool. Thanks for calling right. in. Hey, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Take it easy. Thank right. you. Yeah, you know, this makes me, I, I think back to the last like major uh, issue, issue I had physical was when I had uh, shoulder surgery. I had my AC joint resected. And I remember the doctor gave, I don't remember what the time frame was, but they told me something like, you can't work out for, it was something like eight weeks or something like that. 
And the challenge is this, is that as a fitness professional, you have a better pulse you know, on how your body's moving and what you can and can't do. But then the flip side is you, your tendency is to want to push it. Oh, yeah. But I'm mm -hmm. very, I was very proud of how I handled it. I remember I went to the doctor for one of my first or second follow-up appointments and he said, you know, can you, can, you, can you lift your arm up a little bit? And I went all the way up. And he looked at me like, what the hell? And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a trainer. I know uh, correct, correctional exercise. I've been working on, on my own. And the doctor was blown away. And then he said, you know what's funny, Sal? He goes, we give these like time frames for, for how long you need to be off you know, your, your legs or how long you need to not lift anything over 25 pounds to the average person who doesn't do what you do to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. He goes, but it's obvious you can move things a lot faster when you had know how to apply the right exercises and, and techniques. And so yeah, it's really pretty cool. remarkable when you put the work in and you go into something like that, or even like, you know, pregnancy for, for instance, yeah. like how quick the rebound is when, you know, your body has that kind of uh, muscle memory and it has that, that uh, work already established. It, it, it remembers and, and it, you're able to kind of really rebound quickly. Yeah. My mind's still on the book thing. Doug, what was the name of the book you and I read last year? A story brand. Was that, Oh, yeah. How that, to Build a Story Brand, no. I believe. How to Build? I think it's just called uh, A Story Brand. It's called Building a Story Brand. Building a Story Brand. That's another one, Aaron. So if you listen to this afterwards when we when we publish, uh, that's another good read for your field and what you're into. If you, you can, you can that. recommend that book that you're on the cover of, Adam. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, well, baby. Nice romantic fiction. Seriously, though, there, this is, uh, and, and I, again, I know it's not related to muscle and, and movement and stuff like that. No, but I thought that was great advice. That yeah. you I, I just think that... Um, you know, a lot of times we get so focused on what we can't do mm -hmm. um, when it's related to a lot of things in life, not just uh, working out in fitness. And when you're going through something like this, where you, especially if you love fitness, right? yeah, right, or you, it or even, an identity, or almost. like in his case, he has just a lot of momentum yeah. in, in this direction and his pursuit of health and in getting shape, and he's probably feeling really good. It can be very discouraging. Yeah, you feel like you're in the doldrums. Well, I've, I've I've dealt with this quite a bit with athletes, especially too, where they get injury and it's just it's detrimental because the, your mind it just starts spinning and it's like what I can't do, what I can't do, what I can't do, what can you do? Like, right. And I love that because it's like, yeah, let's refocus that and let's work on ourselves. There's more aspects to life than just this. 100%. Our next caller is Brenda from Michigan. Brenda, how can we help you? Hi. Uh, so, going to try to keep it short. Um, I just had a baby about seven months ago, uh, but I am in the military, and thankfully they, they changed the the – standards that we now have a year to get back to where we were. It used to be six months. Um, I'm just struggling a bit. I kind of lost all of my strength, all of my endurance, everything I worked hard for. Um, so I'm starting back from zero and I'm trying to do everything at once, which is lose the weight, get my pull-ups up and get my run time down. And it's just a lot um, in like, I have five months left. So I was just hoping I could get some advice on how I, I don't want to push it because my issue is I'll push it and then I'll just quit because my body, my body breaks down. Like it gets tired, um, obviously. Um, and that, that's just kind of what I'm struggling with is how to do it all at once without breaking down. Okay. Like, uh, well, yeah. Brenda, are you, um, are you breastfeeding? At the moment, uh, with your, with your mm, still, or are you done? Not anymore. Okay, not anymore. No. All right, that's good because uh, it gets a little more challenging when we're talking about yeah. uh, fat loss while breastfeeding. Well, here's the good news: uh, losing weight might make it harder to get a, a heavier deadlift or a squat, but it actually makes pull-ups and running faster, easier. So right. all, all of your goals don't actually conflict; they actually help each other out a little bit. The weight loss okay. is going to come from diet. I don't want you to try to exercise the weight loss because that's going to be a losing. Okay. That's going to be a totally losing approach. Now, as far as getting better at all of those things that you're doing, you want to do the minimal amount of work to see results because then you can move from there. So what you don't want to do is do as much as you possibly can and see if you can recover from it, but rather do enough to get the improvement to start happening. And then once you start to see the improvement and it starts to happen, you feel good, then you can add a little bit more. So my next question is, what does your routine look like now? Um, so right now I work out about five days a week. Um, that, that's pretty much the most I can do. I, I try to fit in a sixth or seventh in there, but it's just not practical with the baby. Um, I'm kind of alone right now. My husband, um, works somewhere else. Uh, so 
I work, I work out five days a week for about an hour. I do, uh, weightlifting every day, all those five days. And then I do some form of cardio for 15 minutes. Um, I try not to run that often because I, I, I know, uh, my body and I've had two knee surgeries before. So I try to limit my running and I've been doing the rower. So pretty much that's, that's, that's where I'm at. Okay. Well, don't forget, I think, cause she, you have this written up here. So I want the audience to hear this. The, you, you need to be able to do three miles sub 30 minutes. You need to also be able to do a minimum of three pull-ups and then you also need to be able to do a, a minute 10 plank. Uh, Correct. Okay. So to, this is important because this is, you You obviously have to, you, you, the way we're, you're getting back in shape is being measured is by these things, correct? There's nothing else that you have to do physically to prove that you're back in the shape? Correct. And those are all the minimums. So as obviously I, I'd like to do more than that because that's your baseline score. Um, which isn't very good score. Right. Well, so since you, yeah. since you have something very specific like this, we should build your training routine geared around that. So, it, but that doesn't mean that you should be like, for example, the, the three mile, 30 minute run. I definitely wouldn't have you do that every day or even three times a week. I'd have one day a week where you're challenging that. And then maybe, uh, shorter bouts, uh, maybe two other times in the week, but you definitely want to build your routine around the pull-ups, the planks, and this ability to run. So I don't know if I would want you to not run whatsoever because you're going to be challenged that way. Yes, rowing will give you some cardio endurance and and help some carry over to that. But you could take right. – we've talked about this before. You could take somebody who is an incredible swimmer and someone, and they've been swimming their whole life and you can have somebody who's an incredible runner, you flip flop them and they would be, they wouldn't perform as well, even though they both have great cardiovascular endurance, just because they, their body has not adapted to that specific modality. So, uh, we do. And I think five days of weight training is a lot. Um, I think mm -hmm. you could get a lot done in two to three days of lifting. And then the rest of the time and focus, I would be put around these three skills. Yeah, that you pr need practice those things. How many pull-ups can you do now? Uh, I'm at one now. Okay, so so do the, do do you have space in your in your home for a pull up bar? Uh, yes. Okay, so get put the pull up bar up, get a resistance band, tie it around the pull up bar so you can use it to give you assistance. And I would practice one pull up, I don't know, five times a day throughout the day, where you step on the band so it helps you. So it's not like a hard one pull up; it's kind of a moderate one pull up, and you just practice that throughout the day. Planks. How long can you plank for now? I'm at a minute 25 right now. Oh, so you already beat that, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, if you if you want, you could practice that same way, 30 seconds. So you do like a 30-second plank a few times a day. Uh, those two things right there will get way better just from doing that practice. The run, okay. I think Adam gave you great advice. You mm -hmm. could practice once a week for the three-mile run and then do a, a couple shorter runs. And then maybe – Okay. One or two days a week of, of full body traditional resistance training. And on those days, you don't need to do the practicing of the pull-ups and the, and the plank. Those days is just uh, the resistance training. And, and I think you'll see some pretty rapid results that way. Yeah, I mean, I agree with the, the, the protocol they're presenting in, in terms of like also keeping because that is like a specific goal you need to consider. But, you know, trying to kind of ease ease up on trying to take every tackle everything at once, uh, especially in the beginning, uh, really just focusing on your strength training two to three times a week, you know, is, is the major focus there is to get your body back in st strong and resilient. Uh, you know, the the cardiovascular adaptation is going to come naturally uh, as you start to kind of ramp it up there towards your five month sort of goal there. So I would I would definitely uh, try to taper that in the beginning and start you know adding to that in terms of intensity uh, and 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 then go from there. But really the strength should be the focus. And like Sal said, with having a, a pull up bar there, just continually practice that as as frequently as possible. Yeah, you're not you're not training it, or you're practicing it. You just you go you just hop up on the pull up bar when you walk by put the strap in your foot do one and it's like moderately hard if you if you wanted to you could probably do five that's it and then you just get down and then just just practice it and you'll see the strength will go up very quickly with that particular movement. and to be more specific with the running since you mentioned that that you've you've felt your body break down before part of why you probably feel that way is trying to run three miles 
or more as fast as you can, in addition to strength training four to five times a week. If you pull back on the weight training so you're not pushing so hard there, and you also scale back on the, the distance that you're running, I think a lot. So it would for me, it would look something like this if I was coaching you. You would do uh, one to two days or just mile runs. When we do the mile run, we're trying to obviously uh, improve your time every time that you do mm -hmm. that. One time a week, you would do a mile and a half. Also trying to continually improve that mile and a half time week over week. And then the only one day a week would we actually test at the max t uh, distance, which would be the three miles. And then you're trying to slowly improve that. And that's all I would need you to do. And you would be surprised how, how fast your body would acclimate to that and get good at it. And then the practicing, like the guy said, with training. But if you are if you are feeling like your body is breaking down, that's your a clear indication. You're just, you're overdoing it. You don't need to do that. There much. is like a, a program that's somewhat similar. We don't really highlight very often, which is our OCR program. Uh, it does, you know, focus specifically on grip training, but also pull-ups and distance running. And so there is a bit of a protocol in there uh, to try and like meet this timed run. Um, but so that's something too, if it's not, it's not as, quite as specific as like what you need in terms of like what, what your standards are but it would be something complementary to that for yeah sure. it's it's pretty intense though i, I would definitely work up to yeah, it yeah work up to yeah. that you know what brenda do you have prime maps prime pro I, I don't all right we'll send that to you because you talked about your knees hurting you you probably have some mobility issues in your hips or ankles that can help fix that particular issue so that you could start running so we'll send that over to you okay and you know what justin Thank justin, you. justin mentioned ocr we'll send that to you as well I wouldn't jump into that though until you're okay. you're yeah, feeling you good and strong, tests, yeah. Yeah. or just peel, just pull out a, a, a one day out of it. Right? Yeah, you, you can, don't yeah. you don't you don't need That's to follow true. the whole pro protocol. I, I, I know we're Justin. It. Yeah, Justin is is uh, alluding to that because of the uh, pull ups that we we the programmed running. in there and the running. So Ooh. I would I would look at that as far as the programming and how we set that up, right? And use some of that guidance, and then maybe one day a week you can follow one of the foundational uh, training days in there, and that will benefit you but uh, I, I wouldn't actually to sal's point follow the whole program to a t because it's a little bit more than what you you probably need right now but you could probably get some value from it so we'll send that to you too thank you very much thank you thanks brenda you know it's a this is a common theme obviously but it's so how many times have you guys experienced this you do less you get better <laughs> results. The results finally come. Yeah, and it's yeah, always, every I time know. that happens to him, I'm always like, ah, oh, obviously, right? Yeah. But it's such a hard switch to make mentally because usually- It doesn't compute. Yeah, well, usually doing work more and works. working harder equals better, Yeah, right? It's usually not the opposite. Uh, but in, in often in many cases, especially with people who, like Brenda, who are working so hard and you have a specific goal, oftentimes that's what needs to happen. You need well, to back off a little bit. Especially when you're, you know, she's weight training five days a week and then also running. So they're, much. They're so conflicting, yeah. yep. you yeah. know, so uh, she'd be far better off doing mobility three, four days a week and only strength training once and then focusing on the run if she wants to get good at the run. But the reason why she feels the body breaking down all the time is she's probably sore and tight and immobile from all the strength training mm -hmm. and not addressing mobility. And then she goes out and goes for a run for three mm -hmm. miles or like that. And the body just says, F you, that doesn't feel good. And so then it probably sets her back. So there's definitely a way to scale up to this to be able to do all that. Got to consider the recovery process. Our next caller is Isaiah from Arizona. Isaiah, how can we help you? Hey, guys. Um, thanks for accepting my call. Uh, this is super awesome. And um, I appreciate what you guys do and the content you guys put out. So I had to say that mm. like everyone else does. Um so to help set up the question, I am currently a personal trainer. I'm very new. I started this year in June. And the gym that I'm working at, um, the, the amount of time that they give us trainers to work with our clients is 30 minutes. Um, and I felt like that is a pretty short amount of time to kind of figure out what kind of program I want to run for them and what kind of exercises um, I should include since it's only 30 minutes I have to work with. Um, listening to you guys, I've really understood the value of um, making sure you do compound lifts and just the benefits that those offer, um, especially when the client's goals are weight loss or muscle gain. Um, so I've been trying to really incorporate those, but I feel like they take up a lot of the, the, the time that we're given as trainers at the gym I work at. and. Maybe, maybe that's still okay, but I feel like I'm having a hard time figuring out how to program my workout for my clients for only 30 minutes. 
I, I love this question. Do you guys remember? It was actually the very beginning of the podcast. I don't think we've talked about this in a long time. We talked about this. Remember we mm -hmm. talked about like if we only had 30 minutes to train a client, like how would how would we address that? And th this similar challenge was, that, you know, because I get it. Like a, a squatting session could literally take 30 minutes by itself. Yep. Right? Yep. Totally. Um, so obviously the, the first thing is everybody is an individual and this this answer that I'm going to give you would be different based on the client. So you, and this is where you, your skill sets will evolve. You'll have to learn to modify and adjust based on the person, their goals, their needs, their their inabilities and, and so forth. But I do think there's, there is nothing wrong with an entire 30-minute uh, session being dedicated to improving the squat. And so mm -hmm. I, I would actually convince my client that came in that like today we are going to work on the skill of squatting because it's so been, and I would sell them on why I want to do this because of how beneficial it is for building muscle, for burning body fat, for overall function. Like I, we want to get good at this. And so the whole session would be around, you know, these priming and mobility movements. And then we would squat, then we do prime and mobility movements. And then we would squat and it, just trying to get them good at it. And that would be like one of the training sessions. And then maybe the next day I see him, it's overhead press and bench press or something like maybe mm -hmm. I can get two lifts done, but I don't be afraid to do one or two like full body movements like the squat a deadlift over standing mm -hmm. overhead press these movements are so fundamental and beneficial to the client that just because you didn't do seven exercises like listen you could do seven exercises right in a workout for somebody and it'd be less effective than one mm -hmm. and that and, and, yeah. and i think that's the hardest part for some people to understand is like you know you could you could have someone do machine bicep curls tricep push downs lateral <laughs> raises um, you know, cable rows and maybe something else. And I would tell you that I could take that same person and do just one squat session with them and they will get more bang for their buck as far as burning fat, building muscle, yeah. overall movement, overall health. Like, so don't be afraid to, uh, to have a session that's completely dedicated to a movement. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. I mean, simplicity here is key because I mean, it's so nuanced. There's so many different like cues, so many different things you can, you know, peer into it. Actually, they get a lot of value out of that and you have to consider each person individually like what's their biggest need like what can i really hyper focus in on and and educate them and, and build them you know a, a routine that's going to last them a long lifetime and so mm -hmm. this is something too like in considering uh you know each joints function and and, and really like hyper focusing in on that and like uh, alleviating pain or any kind of restriction of the body you know we could just do a session mobility wise where i could really like teach them tricks and and, and ways to, you know, place their body in positions where it's going to alleviate a lot of that. It's going to open up new ranges of motion. It's something that they can apply at home. I'm giving them skills to then apply at home and practice, practice, practice. We come back, you know, we move on and we go to something else like maybe a compound lift or something that has a little bit more, um, you know, involvement in terms of difficulty. So, um, you know, there's a whole scale with that. Like, it's just, you got to look at it as like, how can I sort of, you know, compartmentalize what I would normally do with a, a long session with somebody and, and really just you know add as much value by hyper focusing on and educating this this client yeah isaiah you know your clients so i would do i would spend that 30 minutes on the stuff that they need you the most for yeah i mean so it may be overhead press and row it might be mobility it might be you know correctional exercise i mean it depends on the client I, so I, I, and now here's what i would do if i was in your situation so one of the thing, one of the one of the reasons why I ended up opening up my own studio was because I hated being limited by the big box gyms. They tell me what I can and can't do. It used to annoy the shit out of me, so I opened up my own studio so I could do whatever I wanted. But in the meantime, you're in this facility. You're limited by time, so you got to figure out a way to work around it. Here's what mm -hmm. I would do if I were you. I would do what the client needs me to do the most in that 30 minutes, and then I would say, John – Here's the rest of your workout. Go do that in the gym. I'm gonna be training Susie over here. If you have a question, just come over here and ask me real quick. Yeah. Or I'll keep an eye. Uh, you know, I'll keep an eye on you uh, through the corner of my eye. And if something really happens, then I'll shout across the gym. And the clients won't mind. You know, in between sets, I'll ask. You know, answer your question, or I can kind of watch a little bit, or I know you're doing the exercises I told you. But focus most of the, the, the all that 30 minutes is what you think the client needs you most for. So look at all the exercise, all the stuff you want to do, and say, okay. What do I feel most comfortable this client doing on their own? And what do they really need me the most for? Sometimes it's the exercises that they need the most cues for. Sometimes it's the exercises they won't do alone. So mm -hmm. oftentimes it was like, 
I'm going to do these exercises with my client because they're not going to do it on their own. Like they may need yeah. me, they may need my help with the squat, but I know they'll go squat on their own. But I know this guy ain't going to do mobility, so guess what I'm going to do for 30 minutes with this person? Yeah. Just mobility. So this is where the coaching and training aspect, this is where your expertise comes into play. And those limitations already in my head is in the direction of like how many times can I schedule them a week? Like how can I fill the yeah. schedule up? And Because it's it's going to be a value to them. I'm going to keep teaching them. If, if I have the short, brief moment of time with them, if I can have them as frequently as possible run through all these sessions, uh, you know, I'm going to be able to establish yeah. some, some kind of routine that they can stick I, with. I, yeah, where do you what, – is this a, a big box like gym chain that you work at? Um, pop, I mean, it's called mountainside fitness, so okay. I don't know how big that is. I know it's, I know it's pretty big in the area that I'm in. Okay. Do they, do they allow you to train a client two sessions back to back by any chance? Yeah. I, and I've done that. It's just not every client has the time to do that, but I have done our sessions. Yeah. That's okay. That's, that's what I was going to say. So, you know, if I had a client that I'm like, well, you know, here's the deal. Um, in this 30 minutes, I'm going to focus on the stuff you really need me for, but I'm going to be honest with you. You also need me for other stuff as well. I think yeah. you need to work with me for an hour. I mean, you know, you're the you're look, you're the you're the expert, right? You make yeah. the recommendations and you take it from there and you give them an option. Option one, I'm training you for 30 minutes. I'm going to focus on the stuff you really need me for, but then that means that there's a, a, other stuff that you kind of need me for, but you got to do on your own. Or option two, I'm your trainer. That's it. Everything you do in the gym, you do with me, and I can tell you that you're going to get the best results, and I can guarantee that you're going to be in the best hands doing it that way as well. Well, this also highlights um, the exception to the rule, right, that we make sometimes. We talk about on the show all the time the benefits of free weights and that you know isolation exercises are like in inferior to you know compound movements and stuff like that. But here's an example of where I would use a lot of machines and real basic movements is I would go, okay, like Sal is saying, I'm going to focus on the thing that they need me the most for in those 30 minutes, and then I'm going to prescribe the rest of them. And I'm going to prescribe things that may not be as good, right? So I know that a, a barbell bench press is superior to a machine cable fly or a machine press, right? I know that. Mm -hmm. and But maybe I'm limited to the time and I know there's other things that I could help them out even more. So for the time being, I might, I might squat with them for that 30 minutes and then tell them, I want you to use the machine press here and this tricep pushdown machine here and this bicep curl machine here and then this lateral machine here. And that's what you're going to do after you and I squat together. Yeah. Or this is what I want you to do tomorrow when you don't see me. So I would use these these uh, these exercises that we typically would say are inferior to other barbell dumbbell movements because I'm limited to how much time I can support this client. Or you might have a client who actually, once you show them one time, they do have pretty good form, and you can trust them to go do a, you know, dumbbell skull crusher, or they do pick up bench press, and so you can prescribe that. But I think the answer uh, is going to be is pretty much the same from all of us. Is you as a trainer need to figure out. What you know, if you looked at the perfect program where you weren't limited by time, where are the areas that they will need you the most, and that's where you focus your time, and then the rest, uh, you you prescribe and tell them to do on their own. That's perfect. Yeah, that was my thought process, and I figured you guys would also say the same thing. So my thought process was, if I only if I only have thirty minutes of them, the best thing I can do for them is to provide the best um, service I can in that thirty minutes. Um, and I've really learned how valuable the compound lifts are. So I've been starting out my sessions with those lifts, squats, deadlifts, um, bench press, because I feel like um, those are going to give them the most benefit. And some some of those lifts, you really need help doing that. Like you obviously need a spotter when it comes to bench or to watch form when you squat. So I've been really focusing my sessions on those. Um, and sometimes they take up half of the time. Sometimes they take up the whole time, um, like in a five by five squats, like <laughs> 30 minutes goes by pretty quick. Yep, right. And, and they haven't complained that it's boring or that they're not having fun. Um, they're seeing good progress and yep. they're, they're getting good results. So I just figured I would get some validation from you guys. Yeah. First. But let me interrupt too. Okay. This is a mis And also I don't think you're making this mistake, but be aware of this. Uh, one, a mistake that a lot of new trainers make is they just, they, they completely forget human behavior. What your client needs you the most for sometimes is what you think they need the most. And sometimes it's just, uh, you know, like I said earlier, like I got a client who could definitely benefit from me doing lots of, you know, squats with them. But I also know that they're going to do some form of squats on their own. But the mm -hmm. one thing that they always avoid is mobility work. So guess mm -hmm. what I'm going to do for 30 minutes with that person? Mobility work, right? So you got to think like that. 
what does the client need the most from me and what is going to benefit the mo them the most? Do that in the 30 minutes. So sometimes it's going to be the compound lifts. Sometimes it's going to be the stuff that the client won't do on their own, even though they know how to and they can, they just don't yeah. do it on their own. So that's what you end and up doing. When you, and when you have multiple things that you're trying to address, like because maybe you're hearing salary and you're like, shit, man, they really need me for squat. They yeah. really need me for deadlift. They really need. So there's nothing wrong with you doing this. Like, and, and by the way, the more you, you, you plan this out and share with your clients, the better your resigns will be. So they see that you have this long-term plan and you might yeah. say, Hey, I'm limited to only 30 minutes with you. So this month, what I'm going to do is every 30 minute session is going to be different. And I'm going to go over what I think are the 12 most important yeah. movements I want you to do. And so every, every workout is different for an entire month. And then they practice on their own. That's right. Between, and yeah. then they practice on their own. Yeah. And, and then you focus on maybe just a couple at a time. Does that make sense? Like, so there's, and, and I tell you, like talk about setting up re-signs this is a great way to set up your re-sign because they see that you have this long old plan laid out for them. Tremendous value. You're going to get tons of value in your coaching by you. And what, might end up happening and i guarantee this will happen to you if you do a good job of this many of them are like man this this one day or two day a week 30 minute thing is just not enough for me can we do more yeah, i love it i want to yep. do more of it right and so that's yeah. another way mm -hmm. to uh to lay this out is to you know plan it out weeks or months in advance of everything you're going to be covering with them and then you'll be asking them to do some of the things on their own got it yeah very helpful thank you no problem um uh, yeah, your guys' show has taught me more than my certification has, so I appreciate your guys' content. <laughs> which, which, certi awesome. which certification was it by any chance? Yeah. <laughs> and I've learned a lot, so I'm not going to discredit them, but I've got, I went through NASM. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I was, yeah. I was no, joking. We all started up with that. Yeah, we so, all started with yeah. NASM, so I, no, I, they're, they're, they're a great certification. Thanks for calling in. Oh, by the way, is there, is there any program you want for free? Because uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm in a giving mood. It's a holiday season. Um, <laughs> South to Claus. Um, I would really like... Um, I'd be a fan of either anabolic or uh, performance would be awesome. No, well, no problem. Wait. I'll give you a five percent off code. Just use Adam. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We'll get, <laughs> hey, we're gonna send. Dick. We'll send both those to you. Okay? Wait a second, though. Wait a second before I let you commit to that. Do you own Prime Pro or Prime? No. Okay. Oh. okay so I'm not gonna let you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let you pick I'm because. Sorry. Because here's the deal. Those those two programs for trainers and coaches, I've said this on the podcast again, so I don't, I'm going to insult you a little bit right here. You're an idiot if you don't own those and you're a trainer and a coach. Those two programs so valuable. are so valuable for you as a trainer and coach. Like When it comes to addressing issues with the clients, if you own those or you have those, you should be able to go back and reference that and be able to blow Essential your clients' Essential for your tools. Yeah. Right, so, Isaiah, check this out. All right? Like I said, we're in a, a giving mood right now. You're a trainer. You're one of our favorite people. We love coaches and trainers because we are coaches and trainers. I'm going to give you Prime, Prime Pro, Anabolic, and Performance for free. There you go. Oh, wow. Whoa. All right. Thank you. No problem, man. I, now awesome. listen, you got to do one thing for me. Go, go be out, the top trainer in your right. gym. Go out there and change Kick lives. ass and then go open your own studio so you don't have to follow these stupid rules. Yeah. I, I will do that. I can do that. All right, all right man. Isaiah. Thank you. Thank you. Change lives, buddy. You know, you know what's really annoying to me that gyms do, I can't stand, is they fail to, to, to recognize the following. What's best for the client is best for the business. They mm. just don't think of that sometimes. What yeah. they think to themselves is 30-minute sessions, we can oh, fit this many more clients. Number crunching. It's a lower price point. We're going to yeah. sell more training. No. What's mm. best for the person, what's going to give them the best results, improve their consistency the most, it's going to give the trainers the most tools to do the best job. That's what's going to make your business and your gym crush. Pricing and timeline. It's a race to the bottom. I, it just annoys the crap out of me. And I really wish that a lot of them would do this. And it was funny when I would when run gyms, I would do what I wanted to do half the time and not what they told me to do because I, I understood this. And luckily, they left me alone because when they'd see the money, yeah. then they'd say, okay, well, Sal, you keep doing your thing. But it just it really bothers me when they do that. You know? Yeah, I remember this, though. That was the push for a while because it made sense corporate-wise. Yep. Like, it, let's let's be as efficient as possible. Let's, like, lower price point because maybe price is the biggest barrier. But, you know, then you had you know trainers out there like me. I'm like, I want to sell the, the biggest package I possibly can. Like, I don't want to, like... So I would have to sell these 30-minute sessions and I would just stack them all back to back to back. Yeah, so exactly. That's what I do. Well, I'm going to use this opportunity need to continue to insult Isaiah and all the other trainers. <laughs> that, I'm serious, Kay. The, the kid just said... It's a valid point. Yeah, listen, yeah, yeah, listen, listen, he's a listen, listen to me right now. The kid just got done saying how much he's learned from our podcast in comparison to a national certification. NASM, by the way, runs you $800 to $1,000. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Maps Prime and Prime Pro, the fucking bundle is 160 bucks or so, give or take, whatever it is. That is not that much of an investment. And what that will be able to... What you'll be able to do with that, with your clients... 
will absolutely blow your mind. So if you're a trainer and you're listening to this, and I haven't said this in a while, and you do not own both those programs, you you stop listening to the show. I don't want you listening to the show anymore. You're getting yeah. all this good information. You see all the value in it. Now you're you going to apply it. And you haven't invested in those two programs. And out of all the programs we own, nothing. Dude, we will, made those yeah. for trainers. No, I mean, did. that's really who 100%. we thought about when we made them. And the value is tremendous. And as a trainer or a coach, I'll tell you something right now, if you want to be successful and you had to pick a goal that you could work on in, to make yourself successful, it's not weight loss, it's not muscle gain, it's not performance, it's getting people to not have pain yeah, and alleviate better. pain. I swear to God, if you could do that, you will have a client well, just for life. Two, do you guys remember, I mean, I, I, I totally remember being a, a young trainer and then a client telling me they have a pain here or this bothers them and being like, oh, fuck, I don't know. You know, like, yeah. I don't know. Or trying to guess or figure out, or then going home and trying to research and figure out what it is. Like, literally, that has, like, compass tests built in. So if they have an issue in a joint that's bothering them, yeah. you literally can go, okay, let's do this movement, see how they move through it. They'll and, feel better right away. And then they have yeah. exercises to support that and improve that that are laid out for you. You look like a brilliant trainer and you could be brand new. Like So if you are a new trainer and you don't have that, Slap yourself. Adam's disappointed in you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at his face right You know now. what? Well, cause <laughs> I knew it when, you, mean when one, you were man. asking him about what program. I know. He wanted the cool ones, Yes. Right? He was going, oh, anabolic or aesthetic. Those yeah. are, and I'm thinking to myself, this kid, I bet you, doesn't even have fucking prime of mind, bro. <laughs> <laughs> sure as Cold shit. out, dude. Spoken like a good fitness manager, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides, right? So we wrote a lot of free guides that can help you build more muscle, burn more body fat, move better improve your health and longevity, even guides for trainers and coaches. We actually have one in there for new trainers and coaches. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsalon. Adam is at mindpumpadam. 